From the snowy mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show, including Kingdom of Nye Radio and Revolution Radio. If you want to take a listen to our archives, they are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot. Do a little shopping at the SOR vault. Grab a great book from We Read the Night, our Space Travelers Club is just five bucks a month, and Captain Shirk has you all up to date on the SOR Newswire. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by donating to Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. Boy, do we have a great guest for you tonight. One of the top researchers in North America, from the Graylian Report, Micah Hanks. Pursuing his passion for information-driven talk programming through a variety of podcasts, Micah is the author of several books, including The Ghost Rockets, a survey of drone-like technologies of unexplained origin reported since the Cold War era, and Magic, Mysticism, and the Molecule, the search for the sentient intelligence from other worlds. Michael, or Micah pardon me, has written as a blogger for sites like Mysterious Universe for a number of years, and he has had a number of numerous articles featured in various journals, newspapers, and magazines, his website, micahanks.com. Then at the bottom of hour number three, I'm going to bring you the SOR Newswire brought to you by Paranoia Magazine. Micah Hanks, this has been a while in the waiting, but we're finally here. How you doing, my friend? We have arrived, or I guess as we say in the parlance of this program, we have landed. And it's good to be here. No better place to land. And Dave, I literally just landed back on U.S. soil after a two-week whirlwind trip, kind of a research vacation. I was in Lisbon, Portugal, and then I jumped over to the Azores and then back to Portugal, then up to Toronto, and just in time for the snow to land, I was taking off and making my way back to the sweet sunny south. So, yeah, I've quite literally landed. Great to be here with you, man, although I'm a little jet-lagged, so if I sound giddy, that's probably why. (laughs) Well, you know, we're going to take advantage of that giddiness tonight because, Micah, I look at you in the same category, and I I want my audience to know my opinion of you, and and it's very high, even though this is the first time we've had the opportunity to talk. But... I hold you in the same kind of regard I do, David Weatherly, John Tenney, and the serious researchers who don't come in with opinion. You come in with research. That is what drives you. It doesn't matter if it's filled with woo, and it doesn't matter if it's filled with science. You're all about getting the research, whether it's the stories of people being abducted by aliens to running into Bigfoot face-to-face in the forest, or whether it's scientific technology that tries to help bring some credibility to this field. Why did you go down such a straight and narrow path in order to try and figure out these mysteries rather than hopping on the bandwagons that so many have? Well, that's a great question. And uh, if I can back up for a moment, uh, when you mentioned that your opinion of me was rather high, I was afraid you were about to talk about uh, the new legalization that's occurred up there across the border where you are. But, hey, you know, (laughs) more reason for me to come and visit, I'm sure. (laughs) Oh, uh, exactly. Yeah. (laughs) All kidding aside, though, I mean. Uh, you you did mention David Weatherly, a good friend of mine. In fact, he was right here uh, in my studio just a couple of weeks ago, right before I left, just like the day before I left for Portugal. Uh, Portugal. He and his wife were here in town. Um, I've known David for years, and he's a great guy. Uh, and he is somebody who you can't bring up a topic, I guess, in the broader context of Fortiana and folklore that he doesn't know something about and have an opinion about. And, uh, you know, I love people who – you know, just are thirsty for knowledge like that. And that's how I am. You know, I guess it takes one to know one. I love to travel um, and I love to learn. And and David is very much like that. I think you are too. And for me, you know, it started as a kid. My mom and dad would tell stories or they would share books with me about the unexplained. Uh, But I fundamentally started becoming more skeptical by the time I was about 18 or 19 years old. My initial hope, actually, it it was a lot like Chris Cogswell. You know, he and I recently finally got a chance to talk, and he said essentially the same thing. Yeah, Chris had said, and for those who don't know, by the way, he's the host of the Mad Scientist podcast and, of course, a former member of MUFON, also an independent researcher and a 
uh, a guy with a background in chemistry, materials science. So he is just fascinating to talk to. But he had said, you know, after I began to you know, receive my formal education. And he's got a lot more behind him and in terms of, you know, the string of letters behind his name and also the years in, invested in education than I do. You know, I've got two years in community college and then several years like yourself working in media, working in radio, uh, terrestrial radio. So my background is more in media, but I am a science advocate and I talk about science a lot on my podcasts. But Chris had been someone who, as he was you know, receiving his scientific education, he had an interest nonetheless in, you know, UFOs, the experiencers and that aspect of all of this. And he said, you know, initially I wanted to kind of go to the skeptic group so that I could approach the subject from a rational perspective. But he said that he found that to be a little less accessible. And I think I know what he means because I remember being 18 years old and being a member of a local, I guess, for lack of a better term, paranormal group, although that group had, you know, been involved in a lot more of the, you know, the research-oriented element with all of this, and uh, with a specific interest in the Brown Mountain Lights, which is a variety of, uh, you know, what in the old days would have been called ghost lights, but by today's standards we might call a geophysical nocturnal illumination. Uh, you know, sort of a subdivision of UFO studies in the sense that some of these UFOs, these unidentified flying objects or aerial illuminations, probably have natural geophysical sources. So all that to say, I was always drawn to that scientific side of things, and I was sitting there with the group one night, 18 years old, maybe 19, and I proudly announced, I said, I want to try and you know contribute some articles about this topic to some skeptical magazines. And I remember the guys in the room going, don't do it. Don't do it. They'll never accept you. Well, I've always wanted to be skeptical, but I think that like Chris had said, these days, and I'm not attacking skeptics, I respect a lot of really great skeptics and commentators, and I read a lot of those publications still, but... Um, it was noted by the likes of Marcelo Truzzi, who had been uh, one of the co-founders of what at that time was called uh, PSYCOP, a Committee for Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal. Marcelo Truzzi had initially said he wanted to be able to be a skeptic organ- organization that would investigate paranormal claims, and if there was information that warranted further inquiry, that they would leave it open to the possibility that some phenomena observed and studied could not be explained. But he ended up, after being a founding member of PSYCOP, leaving that organization because he said, hey, I came to find out that some of my fellow members believe that if 99.9% of all unexplained phenomena can be explained rationally, then why not 100%? And he said that that mentality of of skeptic that he found in his, in the ranks of his colleagues would not allow for the possibility that all things, all paranormal claims, could not be explained. And so he left the group, founded another publication called The Zetetic uh, Scholar, I believe. But, and again, that's uh, a whole other story. The point being here that, you know, I think I'm in that Marcelo Truzzi camp of skeptic where I, I think most of this stuff can probably be explained rationally. But we as humans have to accept, as in the past and has occurred so many times before, there have been phenomena observed that we did not have a full understanding of. We aren't able to understand or explain everything that we observe, and we have to be willing to be open-minded when we are confronted with phenomena that is truly unexplainable. So being in that camp, I try to maintain that rational approach, but I'm willing to accept that we can't explain everything. And I think that right now, uh, as far as UFOs go, as far as that subject is, uh, in, in the modern dialogue, you know, in the way that we're seeing not so much an evolution, but just a broadening of that discussion and more and more people being open to discussing it. It's a very interesting time to be alive because we are confronted with something. We won't put a label on it right now, but again, a phenomenon that appears to have a technological component um, that is very perplexing. Many scientists, many historians, many academics, many people in government and policy uh, are beginning to look at this and say, we really need to treat this seriously. And I couldn't imagine a more exciting topic to be dealing with at a time in history like this. No, and I think you hit the nail right on the head, right off the bat there. i got to ask you this, though, because we're going to hit so many topics tonight, Micah. The media. This is something that I am very passionate about, not only with trying to grow Spaced Out Radio to be, you know, uh, a real living component within the media and UFO community, but I look at things like the mainstream 
and the mm-hmm. way they have treated these topics over the years, and yet the mainstream media isn't really sure as of yet, I don't even think, whether or not they want to start taking these topics very seriously on a more professional level. And yet we see television jumping all over this, getting huge ratings, making a ton of money off of these topics, whether it's UFOs or ghost television shows. Some of the highest rated programming ever has been has been ghost shows. I mean, look at Zach Bagans, look at the the original uh, ghost hunters and and things like that. Why do you think radio has been so lackadaisical in trying to get on the bandwagon with these topics, especially knowing the accountants who are now running radio stations rather than radio people. And here they are, you know, wanting to figure out ways to make money in this service, you know, instead of cutback after cutback. And yet we don't see any other types of shows or anything along those lines in the mainstream. It's almost like radio isn't paying attention to what is truly going on out there. What's your thoughts? Well, I mean, we obviously do have a lot of radio programming that is geared toward this. Again, going back to actually even before Art Bell and Coast to Coast, I mean, even all the way back to the 1950s, you know, Long John Neville and late night radio hosts uh, often catered to this sort of subject matter. But I see your broader point, and I would I would really phrase it like this. You can step outside of the unexplained, and you can look at a lot of different kinds of programming uh, on television versus what you see on radio. Let's say that generally in the daytime hours, you know, between 6 a.m. and maybe 9 p.m., the majority of what you're going to hear on terrestrial radio, uh, FM or AM, is going to be music or it's going to be talk. And if it's music, it's going to be top 40. It's not going to be the kind of stuff that you typically, you know, would have on a Spotify playlist or that you'd have on your iPod. Do people still use those anymore? I don't know. (laughs) You know, can't keep up with the tech trends these days. They move far too fast. But on the talk radio side of things, uh, it's generally going to be political talk radio, right? Uh, Political talk, news, current events, and things like that. You're not going to have daytime programming that generally caters consistently to this sort of subject matter unless it's a one-off kind of a, you know, quick piece, you know, a five-minute, you know, story, uh, you know, a human interest story, something like that, you know, showcasing the research of a local researcher and his fascination with the unexplained, something like that. Uh, Whereas on television, different story. There is all different kinds of, 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 you know, every different, you know, conceivable version and variation of uh, paranormal themed television programming. Uh, because again, in that visual medium, I think of television sensation sells and it sells far better than it does on radio. Whereas with radio, it's usually longer format um, conversation driven uh, content. And so I think that that is conducive to the 24-hour news spin cycle, you know, that is mostly political, whereas with television and that very sensational um, visual component that you have there, especially on channels like History and the like, you know, it worked first, that formula with World War II, and people kind of joked about how with History Channel, it turned from the World War II channel to the Hitler channel because there was so much emphasis on Hitler in the Second World War. And then Ancient Aliens comes along, and boy... They find a new formula that works, right? I think it has a lot to do with what the medium is able to offer and what sells the best on that medium. So in other words, with radio, it's always going to cater to politics because of that kind of format, whereas with television, you're going to see a lot more of this sort of programming or, you know, ghost hunting or ancient mysteries or, you know, cryptid hunting, you know, Bigfoot, you know, monster quest, that kind of stuff. However, right now, again, as we see this narrative shifting somewhat, maybe we will begin to hear more of this kind of content on radio as well. I would like to think that that would be the case. Uh, we certainly aren't, uh, you know, at any kind of want for enough podcasts that address this sort of subject. And that's kind of a, a unique phenomenon in itself because podcasting being a very new medium in the actual media of what we call new media in that spectrum, there's a lot of podcasting that caters to the paranormal uh, subject matter and specifically to UFOs. So, you know, you might say that new media, apart from radio and television specifically, has perhaps helped to drive the interest in this subject. I would like to think so, at least. The Internet since the 1990s certainly has. Absolutely it has. And and I think the multitude of shows out there, whether they're 
they're good or bad. At least it's being talked about. But on a terrestrial level, I, I, I just don't get it. You know, especially at night. And I, and I understand the whole political genre of everything. I mean, that's what radio is catered to. Radio is catered to people who are driving or sitting in their office and, and just need something to fire themselves up. That's that's what it totally is. And it, it's a hard format. It's a it's a pressurized format. It's a it, now, especially with the Internet, it's a very, very digitalized and and 24 hour cycle. Do you see the day when, you know, outside of of the grand guru of, of Mr. Nori and and coast to coast where it actually gets to the point where stations are like, you know what? There's profit here because radio at times seems to be so backwards. It could happen. I mean, if you look at online uh, traditional publications, uh, you know, as we've seen since 2017 with Leslie Kane's piece uh, co-authored with Ralph Blumenthal in The New York Times, you know, that uh, first brought to a wide audience the idea of the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, Lou Elizondo, et cetera, et cetera. Once we saw The New York Times reporting on the UFO subject – of course, they caught a little flack from the scientific community, but it wasn't two or three days before CNN has in studio Neil deGrasse Tyson, and they're asking him, what is that? And they're showing these Navy uh, videos uh, utilizing the Raytheon Atflir pod system, and uh, w- which I found funny, by the way, because just because you are, uh, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson, just because you are a famous, uh, you know, astronomer, and physicist, that does not necessarily mean that you are automatically qualified to speak, you know, to the effect of what exactly we're seeing in footage that shows an unknown. And he says that he says, look, you know, I look out there, I look at the stars. I don't know what that is, but I'm glad to see that somebody's taking interest in it. I think that I would like to think that my government takes interest in something like that. Um, and I think it was Alison Camarota, the, uh, the commentator on CNN at the time that had said to uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, but but you do you 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 look at the stars. That is your job, so you're supposed to know what that is. And I'm thinking, see, inherently, right there from the outset, we have not only a failure to understand what the job of the astronomer is, but we have the preconception that because he's looking out into space, he should be able to identify what we take for granted as being a spacecraft. Why do we have these sorts of ideas? You know, why do those stigmas exist? Uh, So that was interesting to me. But coming back to the idea of the Internet and traditional publications, uh, you know, like the New York Times more recently, uh, you know, your friend and mine, Tim McMillan, with his fantastic piece in Popular Mechanics, uh, MJ Benias, and he both writing for Vice and a few other publications, you know, Live Science and certain other publications, uh, well, online uh, mediums, you know, some of them don't actually have an actual print publication, in other words, and many of them are actually moving further and further away from the traditional print medium. But online news sources like this are beginning to see that when they cover the UFO topic and they report on it credibly, their numbers go through the roof, and it has encouraged more reporting on that subject. So, to your question about would radio and, again, more television begin to pick up on this as well, it's possible because we're seeing online mediums uh, warming up to the idea because they see what it does for them. It brings in a lot of traffic, and, of course, you know, the click-through yeah. is made worthwhile. They're able to generate, uh, you know, they're able to monetize that. However, I worry that what's going to happen, and this is my my theory right now, is that UFOs are going through a bit of a renaissance, but it's going to be a bell curve kind of thing where we're about to hit the peak of interest. And gradually, as we begin to realize that this is something that is very difficult to put a finger on, very difficult to uh, study, to predict, you know, when and where it's going to happen, where they're going to appear and learn things about. I think that generally the interest that we're seeing that is so, I mean, there's sort of a peak right now. It's going to taper off a little. And in the coming years, I don't think that people will say that it's crazy to talk about UFOs as much as they did in the past, but I definitely think that the attention span of most people, especially here on the North American continent, will begin to wane as it usually does, (laughs) and it will be less popular. I want to ask you, Micah, as we got about three minutes before we go to break at the bottom of the hour, Mm -hmm. sticking with the media but changing the topic a little bit, over the last couple of years, we've seen a real interest in the mainstream for the first time with UFOs, where they're taking this subject seriously. How would you grade them? 
how about I grade them in terms of their treatment of their the coverage, subject? Their, their coverage, their treatment of the subject, their knowledge. Did they go far enough, not too far? What do you think? How would you grade them? Well, I'll, I'll say this. You know, I love history. And I think that in order to understand anything, um, especially if it's something that science should be applied to, it has to be placed into a historical context, which is why I love the history of science. Many of them report on the technological or scientific aspects of this pretty well. So I give them uh, a B on that. Most, I would give them a D or an F on their understanding of the historical context of this subject. Because, again, and I hope this is something we can discuss maybe when, when we come back, there is a history to this subject that is so often overlooked by the modern commentators. And when they don't understand the history of the topic, it makes it very difficult, I think, for them to understand the implications technologically or otherwise for the modern UFO phenomenon today. Do you think that the media has done enough in their own research or are you like me where you think they got caught off guard? I think they got caught off guard. I think that this is something that, I mean, come on, Dave, you know, most people look at the UFO subject. I'm going to say the average person may have a modicum of interest in the topic. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. I think they're up there. But again, they're, they immediately approach it with the preconceptions of, well, when we say UFO, we mean space aliens, which maybe they are. Who knows? But I think that's yet to be determined. But they, I think, also generally treat the subject as sort of water cooler. Okay, cue the X-Files theme, guys. You know, it's a fun subject to them. They don't really, they probably have never really given serious consideration to the idea. And therefore, yeah, they were caught off guard. They don't take the subject seriously enough to know enough about it to be able to really discuss it with seriousness. And so they're just kind of beating around the proverbial bush. So, you know, yeah, kudos to them for talking about it at all. But quite obviously, most in the mainstream media don't know enough about the subject or treat it seriously enough to really yeah. have this dialogue. Yeah, that that's kind of my thing, too. It's kind of like, you know, when the Pentagon, as we got about 45 seconds, when the Pentagon came out and said, yeah, we've been looking into UFOs for years. I was like yelling at my at my news section on my screen and saying, ask about Roswell. Ask about Kecksburg. <laughs> Ask about Roswell. You got him right where you want him, and nobody ans- asked the question. I was like, oh, you, you let it go. You let it go, man. Well, you can't ask about what you don't know about. That's the big one. Yep. <laughs> That's the big one right there. Micah, you hold on. We are going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. Micah Hanks is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. I highly suggest you check out his Graylian report. It's solid. It's very good. Always, always major information in his show. His website, micahanks.com, if you want to learn more. We're going to get into the UFO topic with Micah right after this. Where have we been? Where are we going? How much history should be played in the future? Does it matter? Does the technology matter? Or is it about the experience? Micah Hanks on Space Out Radio coming up. Hey, space travelers, this is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you'd know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. From the heartlands of Canada to beards around the world, we know how to take care of you. Fill your follicles with the Mighty Moose Beard Oil. All our oils and balms are handmade and 100% natural ingredients because we care about your beard. And hey, use the promo code SOR2019 and get your Mighty Moose Beard Oil today. You can check us out on our website, MightyMooseBeard.com. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. 
Finish off your weekend and kick off your new week with me, Everett Themer, right here on Spaced Out Sundays. I'm going to bring you great guests, a little bit of snark, and plenty of information to think about. But don't worry, there's going to be plenty of woo as well. We are going to hit everything in the paranormal and supernatural, including the odd psychic Sundays. So tune us in on Sunday, 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, right here at spacedoutradio.com. Heading to Vancouver and looking for a night on the town? The Moose Vancouver is the bar that never stops rocking until 2 a.m. every night. The Moose has great food with everything on the menu from $6.95 to $8.95. Fantastic, vibrant staff and rock and roll that will bring you back to when the music was real, the hair was long, and the guitars were rocking. Get your party on at the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Every night on Space Out Radio, we have places for you to hang out. Hi, this is Carl. Join our SOR Space Travelers group on Facebook for live chat. On Twitter, using hashtag Spaced Out Radio, you can also join us in our Spreaker chat room. Check us out on Instagram at Dave Scott SOR. All of our archives are free on YouTube at Spaced Out Radio. By the way, I'll be watching you at your window until you do. Bye! We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. Are you having encounters with the paranormal, supernatural, or ufological that you cannot explain? Look no further than the SOR Sightlines Report, brought to you by the Experiencers Support Association. This is Ryan Stacy, head of the Research Association, TESSA. Soon on the Spaced Out Radio website, you will be able to file your reports and have them researched for you. We are independent and ready to help Spaced Out Radio listeners today. Move over, brother! And let me own Saturday night. This is Rich Giordano, and I'm inviting you to tune on in to Spaced Out Saturday starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, 12 a.m. Eastern, where I'm going to bust open the lids on everything paranormal. Why? Because we want answers, and I'm the guy who's going to deliver those answers to you. Join the chat rooms, and we'll see you this Saturday. Just be there. No, really. Hey everybody, the SOR Space Travelers is open. For just five bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members-only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great forum for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. You wanted new SOR gear, and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable, and you can look good representing your favorite show. So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today. Looking for something new to push your limits? Look Beyond the Spectrum, a new docu-series featuring some of the best researchers in the world when it comes to everything from UFOs, government cover-ups, and Bigfoot in the forest. Truth seekers like Steve Bassett, Dr. Jeff Meldrum, Richard Dolan, as well as others all chip in to bring their knowledge to you. Beyond the Spectrum can be found on Amazon as well as Tubi TV. Tell us what you think on our Amazon page. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from Talk Stream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Welcome 
back to the second half hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. The snow continues to fall. I kind of like it. Means I might get to use my snowblower for the first time this year. I know Everett's going to be a little jealous of that. But no kidding. I love the snow. Love the snow. Hey, I want to remind all of you that... You can check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We got a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, do a little shopping at the SOR vault. You can read up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month. Micah Hanks is here tonight. He's a pretty good dude from the Graylian Report, his website. MicahHanks.com. We're talking some UFOs here right now. Micah, I want to ask you, as a person who has researched and really has a love of history, especially when it comes to UFOs, how important is the history of what happened, say, 70 years ago at Roswell or Kecksburg in the 60s or Shag Harbor, whatever the situation may be, considering what we are seeing today in modern ufology? Well, you know, I would say it goes even further back. And by the way, he's not kidding about the snow up there in Canada, folks. As I was boarding my flight in Toronto yesterday morning, the snow was beginning to fall. And I wanted to be able to get up into the air and above those clouds before too much of it accumulated on the runway. They were spraying antifreeze all over the wings, you know. It was <laughs> quite exhilarating. So, uh, but on on the UFO subject, now I hope you get to use your snowblower, Dave. By the way, that does sound I do. fun. <laughs> well, you, but, <laughs> you, you know what? I, you know what I like to do is I make my little guy, who's six, I make him come outside with me. Oh yeah, and I'll, I'll give him a small shovel and I'll you know pretend you know hey get to work you know I'll play the tough dad role, and yeah. then when he when he gets close to me, what I do is I take my snowblower and then I aim it at him, <laughs> and then he he gets absolutely lambasted with snow. And he usually will end up falling over because it's pretty powerful when it's being shot at you like that. But it's good for a good laugh for me because I'm a little sadistic that way. Oh, but he loves it. Yeah, absolutely. You know he loves it. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. And he feels important because he's out there helping dad, you know? He feels absolutely. important. That's it. Yeah, I can tell you're a good dad. So, yeah. Um, but on the – well, you know, my dad was a good dad too. And, and rather than, you know, pummeling me with snow – uh, as a child, when I was about uh, your little guy's age, my dad uh, probably gave me my first book on this subject and uh, a lot of different books on a lot of different subjects and not just paranormal stuff. I mean, they, they give me books on history and zoology, too. One of my favorite books when I was in grade school was actually about the giant squid. And at that time, you know, when that book was written, we had, you know, the deceased corpses of, you know, these squids that had washed ashore, sometimes in, in pieces and in bad states of decomposition. But, you know, we hadn't observed a living one in the wild. There were only stories about people's experiences with these things. And, of course, our knowledge that even further back in history, it was once believed that the Kraken, essentially, as it would have been referred to, uh, its mythological counterpart, that was believed simply to be that, a creature of legend, until we gradually began to recover the actual uh, physical specimens of Architeuthis. And then, just within the last maybe 15 years or so, I guess, we began to get video footage of living specimens. And now it's rather common. Actually, we act Every couple of years, somebody films a giant squid. And so it's always fascinated me that journey from childhood, reading books about a creature that at one time was relegated to myth and now being something that we capture on film fairly frequently and we know an awful lot about. Now, if we carry that on over to UFOs, here is the very reason why we have to understand the history of a topic in order to put it into the proper context so that we can have a fuller understanding of it. Notice I say fuller and not full because... I had this conversation with our pal MJ Benias recently. I had him on the show. And MJ, of course, in addition to writing for Vice and Popular Mechanics and a lot of these publications about this subject, and he and I both blog for Mysterious Universe as well, uh, MJ is a history teacher by day. And I had said to MJ, you know, here we – MJ actually takes, if anything, I would say more of a sociological perspective – uh, with regard to his study of the UFO subject and his book, The UFO People, kind of looks at, you know, the human element in relation to all of this. And really, 
what else can you look at? I mean, we can talk about flying saucers all day, and sure, there are some photographs that maybe depict pretty good representations of these things, but at the end of the day, the bulk of the information we have about this subject is based on eyewitness testimony, right? It's the story that people... Yeah, our relationship to the UFO subject relies on people's discussion of what they have experienced. And so I said to MJ that in addition to that sociological element, and then there's also that layer of the psychology. And in other words, we see things, but how objective is the reality of what we have seen? There's always that psychological layer of interpretation where we see throughout time very, uh, different varieties of aerial phenomena that people look at and interpret differently. For instance, if we go back to the Middle Ages, people might have seen meteors or they might have seen, you know, perihelion, you know, where there is a, um, a atmospheric phenomena that causes the appearance of, a, of, of double suns in the sky and things like this. And these were often interpreted as being uh, portents or omens. Uh, often they had religious connotations. Sometimes they were perceived as being... Um, you know, signs of favor shown by God or the gods, depending on which era in which these events occur. Um, these often were associated with battles, with religious leaders, with political leaders, political movements, regimes, things like that. So there's that interpretive layer, too. But I said, fundamentally, MJ, you cannot be an expert on what we in modern times call the UFO phenomenon because we have not fully determined what it is. I mean, we have a lot of ideas the leading hypothesis is generally the extraterrestrial hypothesis. But I would maintain, Dave, that one could have an experience with UFOs or with an alien being, and that may not necessarily be indicative of an extraterrestrial presence. I, I think that at the end of the day, no matter how much we know about this subject right now, in other words, we do not fully understand it. And therefore, as we're assembling these puzzle pieces, uh, You can't really be an expert on something that we don't have an understanding of. I think that the only thing you can really be an expert on is, for instance, the history of the subject. You know, we have certain information, and you could be an expert on the analysis of, or you could be an expert on the different theories related to, or you could be an expert on the history of the subject of UFOs. Uh, But it's very hard to be an expert on something that we need, at this time, really still know so little about. So... Yeah, that's why I think history is so important in relation to this, because really, we have to understand the human relationship to it, and we have to understand the phenomenon in a broader historical context. That's about the best we can do right now. We don't see a lot of the media reports. We don't see a lot of the newer ufologists out there who are doing some brilliant work really pay attention to what happened in the past. And let's, you know, for easy sakes, let's stick with Roswell. All right, because that's the one it always seems to come down to anyways. I guess my question to you is, why are we almost ashamed to go down that Roswell Road, ask those questions when it's the most open and and potentially shut case that we have seen in the last hundred years? Well, because Roswell's a mixed bag, you know, there it's very strange. Here we have this report. If you go back and listen to the in, – in fact, here in my studio, and and, and this with, again, my, my disclaimer right here from the outset, uh, I have tried to reserve judgment on Roswell, but I am not as convinced that it is the smoking gun uh, that I once was when I was a child. When I first read Kevin Randall and Don Schmidt's book you know, on the subject, uh, I was just thinking, wow, I mean, this, is, this really is that open and shut case. And yet, years later, you look at how, for instance, Kevin Randall, the aforementioned author, a fantastic UFO researcher, you look at the way his opinion about that subject that he once championed, that case that he once championed, look at how it has changed. He's much more skeptical of the Roswell incident than he was at the time that he wrote books and once championed that. So that has caused me to kind of go, well, you know, how do we interpret this now? The other side of that, too, is that with the government coming out and saying, yes, you know, there was the Project Mogul, the issue, of course, there is that's not the only uh, explanation that has been offered by the U.S. government in terms of what they think Roswell was. And so since that narrative continues to change, that does at times cause me somewhat to doubt the official narratives as well. But then we come back to at the outset, you know, if you read those those 
you know, stories that appeared in the Roswell Daily uh, Record, you know, which actually I've got right here on the uh, on the wall behind me in my studio. Uh, again, being a lover of history, I've got the the two uh, the, uh, uh, the the first report and then the one that followed the next day in the Roswell Daily Record. You know, General Ramey uh, empties Roswell saucer. I love that story because they're very matter of factly reporting in the newspapers that they have captured a flying disc, a flying saucer. And then they say, oh, well, actually, it turns out it was a weather balloon. And then the story just vanishes, right, until it is uh, kind of revived by uh, Bill Moore and Charles Burlitz in their book about that in the 1970s. And uh, although he, I don't think, was was named uh, the civilian researcher, the first civilian researcher who was on the field, you know, not right field, you know, where the, uh, where the uh, wreckage was allegedly taken, but who was actually investigating, interviewing the witnesses, et cetera, that had been Stanton Friedman. And he later went on to champion the case, too. Uh, you know, it, it's revived decades later, and many people who had been there at the time had their own recollections about that. So it's a weird case because from the outset, it had been very matter-of-factly reported that, hey, we've got one of these flying disks, the same thing that Kenneth Arnold said he saw a few weeks ago up there in Washington State. And then they changed the story. Why would it have been reported one way from the outset? And so matter-of-factly, and then that entire narrative changes, you know, and then decades later, when people are saying, yeah, there was something, yeah, there were bodies, you know, I mean, it's a weird story. And yet there's so little in the way of physical evidence in support of it that guys like Kevin Randall have kind of, you know, changed their minds and backed away from it over time. It's a weird story. So, I mean, it's got a lot, a lot of ups and downs. And I think that with Roswell, it was, Dave, at one time seen as being this Again, this smoking gun case, this is going to be the one that opens and closes the book on the UFO question. And yet, so many decades later, we're still trying to make sense of it. That, to me, means that there's still an awful lot we don't know and a lot we're trying to understand, a lot that's that we're trying to interpret. Um, among the UFO advocates, they're going to say it's still the best case of the, the last century. Among the skeptics, they're going to say it was Project Mogul and there's nothing more to see here. Um, it's kind of hard to know what to make of it. But, you know, when we have a case like that, that there are so many unanswered questions, the only way that I can reconcile with it is to say that if it is not the smoking gun, we need to move on and look at cases that will offer a better avenue uh, toward understanding the phenomenon. In in modern Shag times, Harbor? that – well, Shag Harbor? I don't know about Shag Harbor. Shag Harbor, again, in likelihood – and again, this is the opinion of most UFO researchers who would look at this in a historical context. Shag Harbor is probably not a very reliable case. Um, I mean, we know that there was an incident, but, you know, the thing is, is that the gentlemen who were involved with that case, you know, the claims of the slag falling, all this stuff, it's 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 generally agreed upon that those guys were per perpetrating a hoax. No, the case I would look at that is really the one that is going to change the narrative is actually let's speed ahead several decades. We're looking at 2004 in the USS Nimitz case. I mean, here we've got rather than testimony that people have given, rather than, you know, people's claims and, and people's memory of something that happened decades ago and whether or not they really remember it very well. I mean, here we have the video. Here we have the radar operators who are saying this is what we saw. We have the visual and the radar contact. You know, we have the interception. There's so much going on right there, and I think that's why the Nimitz incident has become such a big deal to people because you have this rare instance where you've got people who have seen this, you've got a lot of instrumental data, and there's a video that everybody's seen at this point. <laughs> Indistinct though the object on film is, you know, it seems to correlate with what these people are saying that they experienced out there uh, off the California coast, and that's a big deal. But – the other side of it is that if this all seems to ring true, and this seems to be a legitimate instance where there's a, a bona fide unidentified, yet again, we, we can look back at the history now and say that a lot of those cases that didn't make sense or didn't add up or, you know, there were loose ends and things that couldn't be proven, we can at least look at the testimony some people have given about their alleged encounters with these UFOs. And if they seem to match up with the modern narrative that is forming, it may lend some weight to those earlier testimonies, if that makes sense, right? In other it words, does. well, here's the it thing. Does. If if people look at the Nimitz thing and they say, oh, this is probably our own technology, right? This is probably just some drone that we're testing. I found a case, for instance, from I think 1944 at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where a couple of employees uh, had been driving along at night near the facility and had observed, they said, an oblong white object hovering over the the uh, the roadway. 
and that as they would drive slowly toward it, it would back away and then it would move toward them if they backed up. By all intents and purposes, the description they gave was very much like a large white bus-shaped tic-tac, okay? <laughs> um, it's not to say that what they are describing is necessarily identical to what was described by those who experienced or participated in the 2004 incident, known as the Nimitz incident. But there are a number of accounts in the historical record in relation to this subject that seem to describe very similar things. Um, that should be considered in relation to the modern phenomena, I think. That and the fact that for something like what is described in the Nimitz incident to to uh, be developed by humans, you know, something that has no visible propulsion system, something that has no, uh, you know, wings or rudder. It has, you know, these smooth surfaces and is capable of outfoxing our most sophisticated aircraft. Uh, well, some of our most sophisticated aircraft. There would have to be a number of revolutionary technological advancements take place in order to facilitate that. Um, I'm just not sure that we as team civilization have have made all of those advancements yet, and we certainly hadn't done it decades ago. We've got about six minutes here before we got to go to break at the top of the hour. Micah Hanks is our guest tonight. Yeah, you're right. I, I think that the Nimitz incident is probably the big one because it does involve the military. We've had people come out both the pilots and and the people who were on the Princeton watching this on radar happen, but we'll never get the real story. That's the problem. And I think that's where it gets into the entire aspect of the cover-up that is going on. This is probably the most potential story to come out because we've had so many people come out. But you know the military is trying very hard right now to sweep it under the rug. Hell, they won't even tell anybody, Micah, how those videos got out. Right. Uh, you know, yeah, that's a little complex because our mutual friend, uh, you know, colleague of mine, John Greenwald, uh, has really tried his best, I think, to establish, uh, you know, what would be called the chain of custody. Were those videos released through official channels? And the official statement that he was given by a spokesperson from the Pentagon was that, no, they were not. Uh, however, and I, I, I don't want to say too much in advance of the proper publication about this, uh, but our friend Tim McMillan, uh, who's been on your program, and of course he authored yes, the Popular Mechanics piece. He is a wonderful guy and uh, you know, a good personal friend of yours and mine. Um, you know, I think Tim has been following that subject as well and it, you know he has he has indicated to me during our last conversation on the telephone and keep in mind we were in the same time zone for a rare instance because he's in germany right now and while i was in lisbon <laughs> one day we caught up on the television or on the telephone for a number of hours and um you know i think tim is of a mind to think at this point that indeed actually the the videos were cleared for release but there was a miscommunication and that, in fact, uh, the videos as released, and again, this is all well-known anyway, um, Lou Elizondo, of course, had said that he had released those and had had permission to do so, but the Pentagon had told John Greenwald that wasn't the case. Uh, I believe that Tim is now of the mind, and I'm sure he'll have more to say about that in, com in the coming weeks, that there had probably been a miscommunication, which is not surprising to me because this kind of thing happens in terms of interdepartmental communication or even intra-departmental communication in government uh, agencies, this kind of thing happens quite often. Uh, one would refer to it as the left hand doesn't know what the right hand doeth. <laughs> and you would, you would think that there would be more coordination and cohesion, but it's actually not surprising that in many instances that simply doesn't exist. We're humans. Humans make errors. You know, humans are imperfect. We're fallible. And problems or accidents happen from time to time. And so, in my opinion, those videos probably aren't quite as mysterious as they have been made out to be. And I think that probably in, in the coming months, we'll have a much clearer idea about uh, the proper uh, the, the way in which they were released and the fact that that probably did occur, at least um, the intention had been that it was to occur through official channels and with the proper chain of custody. And that may be established as well. Now, that said, you know, again, the videos themselves whether or not we can will will ever have the full story about how they were released, you know, when they were filmed. We know that the video that's related to the USS Nimitz incident was not filmed at the time of the uh, the actual interception uh, where 
uh, uh, pilot Dave Fravor and uh, three other pilots, actually, and two aircraft went out there and attempted to engage this object. It was filmed uh, adjacent to that aspect, but within the same general time frame of the broader um, uh, Carrier Strike Group 11 and their operations out there off the California coast. Chad Underwood had been the pilot who had actually been operating the aircraft with the FLIR system that filmed that object. Uh, as Tim has brought up in conversations we've had, and I think he said it on my show when I had him on, it was kind of odd to him, and this is maybe the most mysterious thing about that particular video, that they didn't appear to seem to want to try and follow the aircraft. They just go out there, kind of film it. It leaves the the uh, frame uh, the, of the of the actual pod, you know, its actual frame of reference. It just kind of flies off to the left, and they don't appear to attempt to follow or track the object which is kind of weird. I mean, if you see something, you just fly out there, you film it. Okay, we've got it, and we're, we're not going to engage or, or follow it or anything. <laughs> that is kind of weird, and that's what Tim had brought up. That's maybe one of the weirdest things. Yeah. In addition to, of course, the big story that he reported in his Popular Mechanics piece, which has to do with the fact that apparently there was radar data that was obtained by two individuals who came on board uh, and requested that data, the data bricks, uh, is Gary Voorhees, who had been the operator of the Spy One Bravo radar system. They're one of the two operators, I believe he said, uh, on the USS Princeton. That data apparently was removed and taken away by these two individuals who, again, they're, they're mixed uh, opinions about whether they were U.S. Air Force. Some of the people who saw them had said they were sure that they had had Air Force insignias on their suits. Others said they had no insignias whatsoever and that they had had flight suits over what may have been plain clothes. So we aren't sure what agency they were associated with. There are definitely some weird things about that case that suggest there's more information being withheld than what the public is aware of. But again, at the end of the day, I would just maintain that the video, it's interesting but it's indistinct enough that it doesn't give us a really clear idea, apart from the eyewitness testimony that has emerged from Dave Fravor and others who saw the object itself. The video alone doesn't really give us a clear idea of its capabilities or what it was like. We have to yet again rely on the eyewitness testimony, which is like all the rest of ufology, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the big thing. That's the big thing right there. Where does it go? You know, I mean... I'm still trying to figure out. I know I've talked to Tim about this. I know I've talked to John Greenwald about this on personal phone calls about, you know, the little things, the the little answers, I believe, is what we need. That's what the people are yearning for. That's what the 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 fringe media like you and me are yearning for, because those are the little puzzle pieces that we cannot seem to put the rest of the big story together. We'll get into that and more. Coming up, Micah Hanks is our guest tonight. MicahHanks.com is his website. More UFO talk. Strange and weird topics as well. Let's just get into it all. There's no script tonight. We're just having a good time chatting with all of you. If you have any questions, put them in capital letters in our chat rooms or on Twitter. We'll get them to Mike as well. Stay tuned. For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just 5 bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. Call of the Wild is in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is one of the hottest bars and restaurants in the city. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose will rock you like a hurricane all night long. Great food with everything on the menu at $6.95. Near the corner of Nelson and Granville, get your horns up and come rock with us. The Moose Vancouver, the official rocking bar of Spaced Out Radio. A little bit of science, a little bit of skepticism. Add a dash of snark and you have the makings of Spaced Out Sundays with me, Everett Thiemann. Together we will look into the reality of the paranormal with an open eye and rational thought. Oh, did I mention there'll be plenty of woo as well? Your time spent with Spaced Out Sundays will make the night even better. The chat rooms are open, 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, right here at spacedoutradio.com. We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? 
made in Canada. We're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. At SpacedOutRadio.com, we have a little bit of everything for you to stay up late. So while you're there, check out our SOR Newswire, where our team brings you stories of the weird and strange to the WTF from around the globe. News on Bigfoot, UFOs, paranormal, Darwinian-type crime tales. It's the stories that the mainstream media usually won't touch. Well, we got them all on the SOR Newswire, only at SpacedOutRadio.com. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. Hey, this is Canadian Paranormal Investigator Mike Moore. The third Wednesday of every month, I'll be teaming up with Dave Scott to bring you Ghosts of the Great White North. Each month, we will bring on guests from across Canada to discuss their ghostly encounters. Canada is a paranormal hotbed with stories you've never heard, so we're going to bring them to you. So get comfy in your Chesterfield, grab a donut, and join us, eh? Are you having encounters with the paranormal, supernatural, or ufological that you cannot explain? Look no further than the SOR Sightlines Report, brought to you by the Experiencer Support Association. This is Ryan Stacey, head of the research association, TESSA. Soon on the Space Air Radio website, you'll be able to file your reports and have them researched for you. We are independent and ready to help Space Air Radio listeners today. The SOR Vault is open for business, and do we have some cool swag for you to pick up. All you have to do is head over to our website and click on the SOR Vault. You have a variety of cool logos to choose from, and put them on anything you want. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, you name it, we can get it to you. So do your shopping by supporting the store you love. Get your Spaced Out Radio swag at the SOR Vault today. Move over, brother, and let me own Saturday night. This is Rich Giordano, and I'm inviting you to tune on in to Spaced Out Saturday starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, 12 a.m. Eastern, where I'm going to bust open the lids on everything paranormal. Why? Because we want answers, and I'm the guy who's going to deliver those answers to you. Join the chat rooms, and we'll see you this Saturday. Just be there. No, really. Come hang out with Spaced Out Radio, where we own the night. This is Carl. You can follow Dave on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and during the show, use the hashtag Spaced Out Radio to chat with us live. On Instagram, at Dave Scott SOR. On Facebook, give our page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. SOR archives are free on YouTube, at Spaced Out Radio. Come join us, or I will come join you. See you at your window. Get your horns up with me on Spaced Out Radio. This is Ron Bumblefoot Thaw. Come tune in to SOR where you can hear me rock out with Little Brother is Watching, the official theme song of Spaced Out Radio. And then come on over to Bumblefoot.com where you can find out about my tour schedule, my music, and everything else. Bumblefoot.com keeps you up to date on what I'm doing and the best way to stay in touch with my music and music camps. Sign up for my newsletter at Bumblefoot.com and remember, Little Brother is Watching. Hi there, this is Geraldine Orozco from San Francisco's Bay Area Meditation. I invite you to join me the first Tuesday of every month with Dave Scott for Spaced Out Radio's The Spiritual You. In this fast-paced world we live in, it's time for you to take some time for you. We'll cover every possible subject from powerful meditation to healing techniques to your own intuition and spirituality. So come join us for The Spiritual You. Hey Spaced Out Radio fans, it's John Rezig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. 
Our goal is to make the life of veterans, first responders, and those with rare medical conditions 10% happier. We do this by donating one grant item, ranging from dance to therapy programs to prosthetic limbs, to those who need it most. To contribute to Spaced Out Radio's official charity, head over to ChiveCharities.org and become a donor today. Hi, this is Amber Beckrud, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we store all of the SOR show archives for free. And as an added bonus, every two weeks, I'm posting brand new content on Cryptid Tales, where I will get into some of the spookier legends and folklore from around the world and tell the stories that go with them. Find us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio and check out Cryptid Tales today. Drop a comment and let me know what you want to hear. See you there. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Welcome back to hour number two of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Appreciate you guys all tuning on in, especially on our terrestrial affiliates, WQEE 99.1 FM in Noonan, Georgia, KDNF AM 1560 in Dangerfield, Texas, UPRN 107.7 FM in New Orleans, KDUN AM 1030 in Reedsport, Oregon, and in Ridgecrest, California, KZFX 93.7 FM. On the digital side, hi to everyone listening in on Kingdom of Nye Radio and Revolution Radio. Great to have you with us. Remember, you can check out all of our archives for free at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio just do me the favor hit that subscribe button the desert clam has set the password for tonight in the sor space travelers club snood snood is your password yeah Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the clam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, do a little shopping at the SOR vault, grab a great book from We Read the Night. We got the Space Travelers Club. It's only five bucks a month, and Captain Shirk keeps up to date on the SOR Newswire. We're talking UFOs, history. We'll get into some paranormal, maybe some cryptids as well. Micah Hanks is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio from the Graylian Report. He's a gooder. He's a really solid, astute researcher. I put him in the same categories, and you know we're good friends with David Weatherly and John Tenney around here. I put Micah in that category, too. Thank you so much for joining us, Micah. Your website, micahhanks.com. Come on back. That's right. Yeah, make it easy. Just, It's funny. I'm not one of those guys that, feels like I've got to have my name attached to everything. But when it comes to the the Internet uh, these days, there is no easier way for everyone to find you than just to use your name. And, you know, I've still got the Graylian Report, the website, you know. Uh, but the name, I changed the name of the podcast this year to the Micah Hanks program for one simple reason. And that is because I went online and, and was doing keyword research uh, in terms of what people were using to find me, and they all typed in the same thing, Micah Hanks Podcast, Micah Hanks Program. You know, they're like, I don't care what the podcast's called. Where's Micah Hanks? You know, so <laughs> these days, you know, it's like your name is your brand, right? Which is weird. That's the weird thing about the World Wide Web. I mean, you you, you are, if you are trying to be a researcher or if you are a it doesn't matter what you do, a podcaster, you know, it's like you are your own brand, even if you talk about stuff like what we talk about, right? So uh, it's it's kind of an, an odd, uh, you know, I don't know, that's that's paranormal in itself in many ways. But yeah, MicahHanks.com is the website, and you can find everything there. And now I'll, I'll, I'll throw you, a, I'll throw you a, a spin right here, okay? Uh, what would you call this, a curveball? Yeah. Sorry again, jet lag, but <laughs> the uh, after after driving home that point in the last segment about the Nimitz incident being uh, so important in the modern discussion of UFOs and what it gives us that the classic cases that were once you know considered the smoking guns in the uh, field, what they weren't able to afford us, would you believe me if I told you that I'm not really? I mean, I'm interested in the Nimitz case, but I mean, I'm I don't like lay awake at night thinking about it. No, me either. Me either. Yeah. I, I mean, and, I, and, 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 you, and you know what, though? I'm coming at this from a different angle, and I'm curious yeah. about it, because I do want to get into talking about black triangles with you here in a okay. minute. But I'm curious about this. Like, for people like me, okay, I make it very point blank. I'm not a researcher. 
Okay, I'm a journalist by trade. Radio, I just know how to talk on a microphone. That's all it is. But I'm also a an experiencer. And for me, Micah, the technology, what we're seeing with these craft that we've seen in these videos that are traveling at thousands of miles per hour, I'll be honest with you, it doesn't interest me what whatsoever. It doesn't right. turn my crank. I'm not saying that it shouldn't for other people because... There's a lot of scientists out there, both named and unnamed, that are going, holy cow, what is this? I would love to get that on. I mean, we hear the pilots themselves from Fravor on down saying, I want to fly that. I want to fly that. I want to know what it <laughs> yeah. does. And, and I could see where they're excited about it. But as an experiencer, where you don't need disclosure, you just want some answers to right. what is going on, I see it as... I don't care about the technology. I don't care about if this thing can do, uh, you know, be traveling at 36,000 miles per hour, come to a dead stop and then hang a 90 degree turn right back to 36,000 miles per hour within a second. Impressive. But I want to know what the hell happened to me. Other experiencers are in the exact same boat. You know, how do we define any type of disclosure, whatever you want to call it, when you have two sets of people who are looking at this entire phenomena with way different eyes? Exactly. And see, I am not a I'm not an experiencer. Uh, I have never really seen anything that I would call a bona fide, unidentified flying object. I've seen some unusual things in the sky on you know occasions, but I mean, nothing that I would th- think would really qualify as the kind of UFO we're trying to discuss right now, which would be uh, objects that are quite obviously under some kind of intelligent, controlled, structured, engineered objects, however you know smooth their exterior surfaces are, however little evidence of any kind of propulsion system there may be. Nonetheless, we seem to be dealing with a technology under intelligent control, those kinds of UAP or UFOs. I've never seen anything that I think qualifies as one of those. But, like I said, the Nimitz case is fascinating. And I'm telling you, when you've talked with the guys who were actually a part of this, you know, I've spoken with Gary Voorhees and Ryan Weigel. They're fantastic. And after actually interviewing them and talking with them at length about the case. Uh, PJ Hughes reached out on Twitter and Kevin Day on Facebook, and I haven't really even begun to uh, correspond with those guys to the extent that I have Voorhees and Weigelt, but it's incredible, and I hope to, you know, further this dialogue with those gentlemen, uh, you know, in the future. It is incredible to get their experiences and their perspectives on this case, and I'll actually say this. There is another individual who is a part of the carrier group, who has not come forward yet, but who I have begun correspondence with uh, after interviewing uh, Voorhees and Weigel. And so I'm, I'm, and he wants to talk with them too. It's, it's more and more of them over time are coming forward. And so this is really exciting. But that said, as a researcher, I can relate to you as an experiencer in the sense that I'm looking for answers to the broader question. And so I see as a researcher who has looked at it, I mean, again, I was talking with Dave Beatty who is a fantastic filmmaker. He made the film The Nimitz Encounters. And he, uh, in addition to being a fantastic researcher, is a real deep thinker. And talking with him about this, you know, we're we're both very interested in this subject. And although he made a film about the uh, Nimitz incident, and uh, in, in fact, it was because of Dave I was able to interview a couple of the uh, the, the gentlemen who were on, uh, you know, on board the, uh, the uh, carrier group in question, uh, them and also Dave Altman, who is representing them, and Dave Altman actually Good arranged guy. that interview. So, yeah, thanks to Dave. You have to give him a shout out there. Yeah, but, we do. But, you know, Dave uh, Beatty and I talking about this, you know, we both were like, you know, I asked him, I said, do you get more stories from servicemen and women and people who have had experiences? He says, oh, God, yeah. He says, every day I'm getting emails from people. And I said, do you not get emails where people tell you stories that if they got the kind of attention that the Nimitz case does – I mean, they'd be an even bigger splash. What they lack, of course, is, you know, a video, uh, you know, multiple eyewitness, either people who actually saw the object or people who were watching, you know, on television as the intercept was occurring, people who saw it on radar, whatever the case may be, people who are part of that. There is a unique blend 
you know, it's a perfect storm with the Nimitz case. That's the significance of that case and why I bring it up. But for researchers or experiencers, I can only imagine that we have much deeper questions because we see the Nimitz case as being one piece in a much bigger puzzle. Okay, and that's, again, why for me, I don't lay awake at night thinking about what was that thing? What's the Tic Tac? I lay awake at night thinking, am I doing enough to further our understanding of this? Am I being critically minded enough about this? Am I being skeptical when I need to be? Am I being open-minded enough when I need to be? What are the right questions to ask? To hell with the question. You know, I mean, or rather, I guess the old expression is to hell with the answer. What was the question, right? Sometimes the question is actually more important than finding the answer. So, yeah, you know, these are the kind of things I lay awake at night thinking about. What role do we as people play in all of this? You know, what I I can't help but think, for instance, one day we're going to meet aliens. We're going to find aliens, right? And we'll establish communication and we'll say, man, we've been watching you guys for years and you're flying saucers. And they'll say, oh, those things. Yeah, those aren't ours. We were hoping you guys knew what those were. <laughs> you know, I can't help but think, you know, one day we're going to we're going to realize maybe this phenomena is not what we thought it was. It may be far more complex than we ever thought it was. You know, those are the kinds of questions I have. Me, too. Me too. And and are we at that point, before we move on here, are we at that point where we're able to bridge that gap between the science and the experience? Or is that bridge still far from being made? I think we're a ways off. I mean, I would have to say I think we're a good ways off because for us to be, you know, here, here's the thing. I am of the mind that UFOs, whatever they are, represent a physical, tangible phenomena that science can be applied to. But the problem is that we're not dealing again. Tim and I talked about this recently. Uh, we are talking about something that is a natural phenomena that is predictable. You know, um, generally, when it comes to science, a good um, a good scientific uh, theory is something that, when applied to a phenomena, a very simple, a very simple, you know, theory will explain a wide array of different phenomena. Relativity is maybe the best example of in, in modern times. You know, Einstein so eloquently and simply was able to explain so many different phenomena with his theory of general relativity. So a good scientific theory doesn't have to do a whole lot to explain a whole lot. But that usually only works in relation to phenomena observed in nature. So it's not to say that there are not ways that science can be applied to something perplexing like UFOs, but I doubt based on, again, the accumulation of eyewitness reports in the historic record, which is fairly recent, really, if we're talking about modern ufology. But again, there are a lot of uh, cases from antiquity up until the present, you know, spanning several hundred years that written about in the past as religious or or, you know, supernatural phenomena and things like that, they may very well represent the modern phenomena we recognize as UFOs, but it's very difficult to look at historic accounts and say that that's what we're dealing with. Again, because we as humans are going to project our own ideals and values onto them, I think it's potentially very dangerous, and this is why I'm not an advocate personally of the ancient alien stuff. I don't like looking at, you know, classic, or, you know, or, or actually reports from antiquity, from, you know, the classic period, you know, and say, well, you know, what these people are discussing with their beliefs, values, language, etc. of the time is obviously the UFOs that we're used to seeing today. That's usually probably not the case. And there are so many levels of perception and interpretation that have to be waded through that I think it's almost fruitless. So in terms of UFOs, as we know them today, the modern UFO phenomena, we can basically start at around 1947, despite the fact that there are some compelling reports that predate that. From 1947 onward, we're really dealing with after the Second World War and the arrival of new technologies, right? Radar, um, aircraft, jet aircraft. So we've got aircraft that are capable of maneuvering well enough that they're able to, at times, pursue these aircraft. You know, you got the famous, you know, uh, you know, sightings from aircraft. And also the uh, the dogfight, you know, that's popularly uh, it was it was uh, dramatized on the Project Blue Book uh, television program on history and whatnot. But this was an actual Blue Book era case where there was an aircraft that attempted to intercept a little light that was, 
you know, buzzing around. It wasn't a very large aircraft by any means, but there was something that was being pursued by an aircraft. So we had aircraft that was capable of doing that. We had radar systems that were capable of discerning when and where this phenomena was. That's a trend that you began to see starting after the second, actually during the Second World War and, and in the years immediately afterward. New technologies allow us to perceive the phenomena better and beyond, again, what the human senses alone can do. The Nimitz case is no different. Again, we've got tracking capabilities, infrared FLIR systems and things that help us perceive beyond what the human senses alone can perceive. And that's going to be the game changer as technologies advance, I think. We're going to be able to continue to broaden beyond the scope of natural human capabilities. And it will help us define and perceive and even track and maybe predict even the appearances of this phenomena as time goes on. But again, as far as the modern UFO thing goes, you know, this is a very perplexing kind of a kind of a thing to put a finger on. And I don't know, it's 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 strange sometimes to really try and look at it in that historical context and think, you know, so really in light of all that, wh- where is all of this going? You know, what are we going to learn about it? As time goes on, is it something we'll be able to learn? But again, coming back to the primary point that Tim and I talked about, this seems to be a phenomena that is not a natural phenomena. This is not something in nature. And hence, yes, I think science can be applied to it and technology is helping us study it. But it's not going to be something that can be easily predicted like natural phenomena, right? You know, it's not going to be like a general theory of UFOs like general relativity. It's going to be something that we're going to have to chase in order to be able to get information about it. Do you think we're ready for those answers? I don't know. I couldn't tell you. You know, again, if we aren't really sure what we're dealing with, I mean, think about this. Again, in the broader context, Dave, if people were told, yeah, these things are extraterrestrial, you know, these are alien beings. And again, as an experiencer yourself, you have your own ideas about that. Imagine if that were really presented to the public. I mean, could the public really handle it? Many say yes. Previous governmental studies, uh, you know, like the Rand Corporation study that was done back in the 1960s, I believe, you know, they were very concerned about what the public would do, how they would react to any kind of revelations about this phenomenon. And that a lot of it was based on the famous Orson Welles broadcast of War of the Worlds, right? People went nuts when they thought there was an alien invasion occurring. So we think now we've kind of... um, you know, there's been enough conscious evolution, you might say, that we've warmed up to the idea. Now people could handle it, right? Could they really? I'm not sure. I don't know. I personally do not think so. I think those who have had experience with the phenomena could, for the most part. But on the flip side, there are those who, you know, whether they've been indoctrinated by politics, their their own growing up, uh, beliefs from their family, friends, whether they're they're of some religious connotation. I don't think that there's a lot of people out there who are willing to handle the fact that we are not alone. Or they may be able to handle that, but they're not ready to handle the fact that they're here. I wonder sometimes, even for those who are in the research community and who have spent maybe a lifetime studying this phenomenon, If it really came down to the point where they see, and I'm going to go ahead and make a segue here, if a great big black triangle is hovering over their house, (laughs) I mean, is any amount of reading about it ever enough to prepare yourself for finally seeing something that is so far beyond the scope of what you're used to experiencing that you cannot even relate to it in a normal sense, in a normal capacity, and therefore you are left standing their jaw, you know, hanging agape, and you're going, okay, what the hell is that? You know, I mean, I'm I'm waiting for that experience myself, but I mean, plenty of people have already had it. And so, yeah, broadly, I'm not sure that we as a culture, as a, a, you know, as team civilization are really completely ready for that because I'm not sure that we uh, have anticipated all of the implications of what that kind of, that broad level of contact would indicate. And again, I say contact, but that does not explicitly mean I'm not I'm not saying when E.T. touches down, you know, I'm leaving that open to a wide array of possibilities in terms of what this phenomena could be or several different phenomena within the, you know, under the umbrella of what we call UFOs. I think there's this this interpretation that, well, UFOs all must be one thing. 
I don't think that's necessarily the case. In fact, under the broad umbrella of ufology, I mean, I study everything from natural phenomena like earthquake lights, ball lightning, auroras, green flashes, all kinds of natural luminous phenomena that occur in nature uh, to the reports of big black triangles and what appear to be, I mean, without question, structured aircraft. So to me, really, ufology encompasses a lot of different areas of study that entail a lot of different things. I don't say that there's just one thing that we're calling UFOs. I just want to be explicit when we're referring to those structured aircraft. And when we're talking about those, let's make sure we all know we're talking about something that appears to be constructed and intelligently controlled. Michael, we have about two minutes here before we got to go to break at the bottom of the hour. Getting to the blank triangles, and we can continue this after the break. Do you think they're ours, or do you think they're of another civilization's? I mean, I could tell you what I think, but yet again, you'll probably notice this trend with me. I try to leave um, conclusions out of the equation if I don't have enough data you know, but there was an interesting study that was done. And again, for anyone who may not be familiar with this subject, although they're kind of a trope in modern ufology, most people who have read about this will know what we mean when we say black triangles. But there have been an accumulation of reports, especially since the late 1980s, although in the literature there are some reports that go even further back. Uh, researcher David Marler has done a fantastic job. He wrote a book called Flying Triangles, An Estimate of the Situation, which chronicles the history of these reports and his own personal investigation into them. But especially during the late 1980s throughout the 1990s, there were a, I mean, there was really a kind of a flap, you might say, during that era where people reported seeing massive, sometimes football field sized, black or darkly colored triangular shaped aircraft that moved very slowly. And again, for my own part, I've interviewed many witnesses over the years who have shared with me very vivid and detailed personal encounters with these things. There was a study that was carried out by the now defunct National Institute for Discovery Science, which was headed by Robert Bigelow a number of years ago, where they found that the areas where these things are most commonly seen coincide with flight corridors between U.S. Air Force installations, which led them to interpret them as possibly being of earthly origin. Now, that's not definite, but that was something that they discerned. So, at very least in terms of data, that would be a possible origin. I'm open to other interpretations, though, because many would say, look, again, these things appear to be something far beyond known technologies, at least in terms of what civilians know about, that are known to exist today. Well, we're going to hold it right there. We'll get right back into them when we come back here on Spaced Out Radio. Micah Hanks is our guest tonight. His website, micahanks.com. Have you seen a black triangle? What do you think they are? Let us know on social media, either on our Facebook pages or on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. I'm going to tell you a funny story when we come back as well. More Spaced Out Radio coming up right after this. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. From the heartlands of Canada to beards around the world, we know how to take care of you. Fill your follicles with the Mighty Moose Beard Oil. All our oils and balms are handmade and 100% natural ingredients because we care about your beard. And hey, use the promo code SOR2019 and get your Mighty Moose Beard Oil today. You can check us out on our website, MightyMooseBeard.com. Move over, brother, and let me own Saturday night. This is Rich Giordano, and I'm inviting you to tune on in to Spaced Out Saturday starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, 12 a.m. Eastern, where I'm going to bust open the lids on everything paranormal. Why? 
because we want answers and I'm the guy who's going to deliver those answers to you. Join the chat rooms and we'll see you this Saturday. Just be there. No, really. Every night on Space Out Radio, we have places for you to hang out. Hi, this is Carl. Join our SOR Space Travelers group on Facebook for live chat. On Twitter, using hashtag Spaced Out Radio, you can also join us in our Spreaker chat room. Check us out on Instagram at Dave Scott SOR. All of our archives are free on YouTube at Spaced Out Radio. By the way, I'll be watching you at your window until you do. Bye! Heading to Vancouver and looking for a night on the town? The Moose Vancouver is the bar that never stops rocking until 2 a.m. every night. The Moose has great food with everything on the menu from $6.95 to $8.95. Fantastic, vibrant staff and rock and roll that will bring you back to when the music was real, the hair was long, and the guitars were rocking. Get your party on at the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Finish off your weekend and kick off your new week with me, Everett Themer, right here on Spaced Out Sundays. I'm going to bring you great guests, a little bit of snark, and plenty of information to think about. But don't worry, there's going to be plenty of woo as well. We are going to hit everything in the paranormal and supernatural, including the odd psychic Sundays. So tune us in on Sunday, 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, right here at spacedoutradio.com. Hey everybody, the SOR Space Travelers is open. For just 5 bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members-only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great forum for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. Looking for something new to push your limits? Look Beyond the Spectrum, a new docu-series featuring some of the best researchers in the world when it comes to everything from UFOs, government cover-ups, and Bigfoot in the forest. Truth seekers like Steve Bassett, Dr. Jeff Meldrum, Richard Dolan, as well as others all chip in to bring their knowledge to you. Beyond the Spectrum can be found on Amazon as well as Tubi TV. Tell us what you think on our Amazon page. You wanted new SOR gear, and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable, and you can look good representing your favorite show. So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckrude, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. Hey, space travelers, this is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. Hello, this is Yogi Tall Man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. 
You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is watching. We pass the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair at SOR headquarters. The snow continues to fall. Yes, I love it as it gets close to Christmas at this time. Hey, I want to remind all of you, free Christmas podcasting at our YouTube channel. It's all free all year round. I'm just trying to make it sound better than what it is. YouTube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website, SpacedOutRadio.com. we got a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot. Do a little shopping at the SOR vault. Grab yourself a membership at the SOR Space Travelers Club. Five bucks a month. we got books that we read the night. And Captain Shirk will keep you all up to date on the news. Micah Hanks is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. We're just about to get into black triangles. What are they? Are they real? Are they ours? Are they theirs? MicahHanks.com is his website. Welcome back, sir. Yeah, good to be here. And, you know, to answer one of those questions, I'm almost convinced, yeah, that they are real. What they are is another question. Well, we just don't have to do a segment now. You just answered it. There we go. (laughs) We're Kept done. All right. We're, we're just going <laughs> to shut this down right now. Mike has answered all questions regarding black triangles. <laughs> no, but but on the flip side, I mean, we have people out there. I mean, if you believe in the secret space program and you know what, if there's anything I geek out on, it would be that. And I blame Michael Schratt and Olaf Phillips for that in getting <laughs> yeah. to know those two gentlemen, especially Mike, Michael uh, Schratt, who I will uh, get to to uh, meet again again at the UFO Con 2020 in San Francisco. I got to tell you, when I met him two years ago at UFO Con, I was like a, a, a young lady in the 60s seeing the Beatles for the first time because I just fell in love with his research and how accurate he is with being a, a, an airplane historian and, and the research that he was able to conduct and looking at all these secret craft that he believes are out there, it's phenomenal. So it wouldn't surprise me if these black triangles were a combination of ours and theirs. Well, yes. And in fact, uh, I I keep in my studio here a number of uh, posters and uh, other kinds of media on the wall for reference. Uh, And so right next to my projectile point sequence for South Carolina that was assembled by Dr. Christopher Moore, who's a very talented geoarchaeologist in South Carolina. Yes, next to that projectile point sequence, I have not one but two of Michael Schratt's uh, fantastic legacies of anomalous aircraft, I guess you could call. One's a legacy of classified aircraft. The other is a legacy of UFO case files that include his computer-generated renderings of these aircraft that you were just describing. So, yeah, fantastic researcher Michael Schratt. Yeah, when when I ran into him, he was sitting having a dinner with uh, Melinda Leslie, and mm-hmm. I had to do it. I did a triple take, and finally I went up because you know I normally I, I'm a pretty shy guy. I know the audience members will be like, really, <laughs> but no, I I am actually. So because I knew Melinda, I had the in, and I went, and she goes, oh, let me introduce you to Michael. I said, I thought that was you, and I and I fangirled. I totally fangirled over him and uh, got my picture taken with him. That that made my entire weekend, entire weekend. I quickly ran over to where my booth was, grabbed him a T-shirt of Spaced Out Radio, and and made sure that he had it on, uh, that he got a free T-shirt and hat over that because I just I needed that, needed to but get be- that done. But before you could bring it back over to him, you burst into glitter, didn't you? I almost did. I'm not going <laughs> to lie about that. I, yeah. I, I almost did. You know, I think my, my voice went up another couple octaves. Hi, Michael! Michael! You know, you know all this kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, I, I was sheepish. I was like, um, uh, Michael, uh, do, do you mind if I, I get a photograph with you, please? And he's oh, sure. You know, and I was like, oh, man, I'm such an idiot. Such an idiot. But 
you know what? Anybody who is, we'll continue the conversation, but I'm sure you'll agree, Micah, anybody who is not, or who is in this field, who has interest in this field, who has not YouTubed one of Michael's speeches and, and, um, videos that he has up there of him speaking you're really missing out aren't you oh gosh yeah yeah he is you know he he is someone who does not just approach this subject in terms of ufos whoa what the hell are they you know he he goes into the history of of both known and speculative uh aviation you know on the human level right and and he kind of builds up from there, and so that's what makes it so fascinating. He really gives us a unique perspective on the black world, so to speak. Which is again, when it comes to the discussion we were having earlier about these, you know, these large triangles, uh, that is where many believe that this subject, uh, re- you know, would would exist. This would be again, I reference that NIDS uh, uh, study, the National Institute for Discovery Science. Uh, conducting and again this was a civilian ufo investigative group that was essentially uh assembled and and financed by robert bigelow for a time um you know many especially skeptics have kind of criticized it because again uh some of the key players and of course robert bigelow with his own very obvious interest in ufos over the years they would question the science of an organization headed by a guy who's out there trying to prove that ufos exist then again the other problem is, is how many other scientific organizations are there really seriously studying UFOs? And I always found it interesting that when NIDS did their study of the Black Triangle reports, they didn't say, well, we conclude that, that these things are beyond the scope of any known human technologies. No, they said, actually, based on where they are seen and the proximity of those sightings to U.S. Air Force installations and other you know, high security installations, these things are probably ours. That was the determination uh, determination that they made. But, you know, what was really interesting to me about them is uh, uh, looking at it from another angle, there used to be a page, and it's still accessible online, but it's just harder to find. Um, the Federation of American Scientists uh, also began to look at some of these mystery aircraft. And uh, Stephen Aftergood has produced the uh, FAS's uh, secrecy newsletter for a number of years. And back during the 1990s when Project Aurora, as it was known, uh, this was the the hypothetical name for a speculative aircraft, a successor to the F, uh, or I'm sorry, the uh, SR-71 Blackbird. The uh, w- when this was big news, the Federation of American Scientists uh, secrecy newsletter that Africa was putting out spent a fair amount of time looking at reports of unusual aircraft, and actually, Aviation Week magazine did the same thing. And they were looking at everything from what was known as the mothership, which was a large aircraft that had been witnessed by a number of observers over the years. No, not like a saucer or a triangle or anything like that. The mother, uh, the mothership, as it was known, was simply a large aircraft that was designed to deliver a uh, space plane uh, to a high enough altitude, then release that aircraft, which would travel on in low Earth orbit uh, on its own. But it was basically a uh, a a two stage aircraft delivery system that was uh, you know rumored to exist it was never actually officially disclosed to the public but uh, aviation week was on the trail of the so-called mothership for a number of years and believed that it indeed did exist this was one of many hypothetical aircraft i'm sure michael schrack could probably give you a much better history of that but among the varieties of different aircraft that the federation of american scientists began to look at uh, beginning in the 80s and 90s i guess they had begun. They had, they had taken quite seriously these reports of these large um, aircraft, uh, which we would call the Black Triangles, and they had described some of the really peculiar characteristics of these. For example, there was a sighting over California where one of these things they said was just moving at snail speed, very slowly, and a, a guy said he was he was riding his bicycle and observed this thing, and he was able to pedal on his bicycle faster than this aircraft was moving, which, if this were any kind of conventional plane, it you know, wouldn't have been able to, to do this, and let alone the fact that this thing was moving almost completely silently. Some people described a kind of hissing or a whirring kind of noise, but there was very little noise associated with these aircraft. 
But the really peculiar report that was uh, logged by the Federation of American Scientists involved this aircraft, they said uh, it would tilt on its axis so that it was actually perpendicular, uh, in other words, with its nose or what appeared to be the front of the aircraft pointing directly downward with its tail directly upward, it could it could shift forward like that and completely set itself perpendicular to the ground, uh, which, again, tell me any aircraft that does that. I mean, it was really peculiar, some of the, some of the behaviors of these aircraft. Um, the, the speculation at the time had been that this had been some kind of a platform blimp, in other words, a large, flat uh, blimp or dirigible type aircraft of some sort. But what's really interesting is that, you know, when you look at the reports of these things, I mean, these are far bigger than most aircraft that, that you, you know, that you hear about. They appear to fly at low altitude and almost always at night. And so this seems to tell us a number of things. One, they are quite literally, you hear that, the expression below the radar, right? Well, yes. the in, the idea is that these large triangles seemingly are flying at low altitude at night because fewer people, there are going to be fewer witnesses that are going to see these things, and they're actually flying at low enough altitude that they are not going to be easily detectable by radar. Now, that brings us to one of the most well-known and well-documented cases involving one of these aircraft, which was um, the famous St. Clair County, uh, Ohio incident from, I believe it was 2000. And uh, this was a incident that was first reported to law enforcement there in St. I'm sorry, it wasn't Ohio. It was Illinois. I misspoke. It was St. Clair County, Illinois. It was reported to law enforcement. Um, a law enforcement officer on duty was was dispatched. They said that there was what dis- was described by the observer who was, I believe, a trucker who had just come in off of a late night shift. It was you know, probably one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. He saw what he said looked like a house. I mean, he said it looked like a building floating over his house, moving slowly away. So he calls the police and says, there's some sort of weird aircraft out here, and this police officer's kind of chuckling and laughing about it. Later, the police dispatch recordings were made available in the public domain, and you can hear his response. He's like, "Uh, okay, well, so somebody says they saw a UFO. Okay, I'll go check it out. Well, he gets out there, and he sees the thing, and then it's no laughing matter. He's like, okay, wow, this thing really is here, and it is big. Over the next few uh, maybe hour an hour and a half, uh, many different police officers in different jurisdictions in that region also responded and were able to observe the aircraft. And one of them actually photographed it with a Polaroid camera. That photograph didn't turn out very well. All you see is three little kind of squiggly lines as the aircraft was moving away. But nonetheless, the police dispatch recordings are unique in the sense that they give a real-time account of what the police officers said that they had seen. Now, there have been skeptical interpretations uh, that have been offered, including the one uh, by uh, uh, Brian Dunning, uh, who's done some fantastic work as far as skeptics go. But, you know, Brian it, Brian's contention had been that this had been one of the American Airship Company's blimps, uh, simply giving a VIP tour at around 3 a.m. <laughs> in the morning. Uh there was no record that the American Airship Company had supplied that actually accounted for a blimp being active, giving any kind of VIP tour at 3 a.m., uh, coinciding with this sighting. And furthermore, the dispatch recordings explicitly describe the officers saying this big, it's a triangle, this thing is moving really slow. But at times they said it would pick up speed and it would move very fast and cover a very short dis- a very large distance in a short amount of time. So there were a lot of anomalous aspects of this of this aircraft and its behavior. Uh, But again, the general description that almost all of the law enforcement officers described as they were seeing it, and this was being recorded by dispatch, described a large, dark-colored, triangle-shaped aircraft with lights oriented on the back of the aircraft and one light that was moving from left to right across the back. Um, You know, again, it's it's one of the more notable cases. David Marler, who I mentioned earlier, has investigated this. He actually, and this is immediately before the 9-11 terrorist attacks of 2001, um, he had uh, been giving a lecture about this in early 2001 at the Eureka Springs UFO um, uh, conference there in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. And a former flight, um, he was a former air traffic controller there from uh, Illinois, 
came up to him afterward and said, you know, I used to work as a air traffic controller at that regional airport there in Illinois. He says, I think I could take you there and we could introduce you know, you to some of the people who actually were working that night. And so this was arranged. David goes, he talks to some of them. He asked, was there any radar data available? And they said, well, no, the tapes are usually wiped. And so we don't have any radar data about this incident. Um, the near the nearby Air Force Base, I think, I think it was Scott Air Force Base. Uh, they had said that their radar systems weren't operative at the time that the object was in the area. Uh huh. <laughs> well, they're about to leave, and uh, as David told me over a Guinness when he and I were out in Wyoming together in Hewlett, Wyoming last fall, uh, speaking de- together at an event, we we hung out he and his girlfriend and I for a long time, and he said, but right before we left the air traffic control center he said they took me down to the rec room and there was a guy sitting in there watching history channel having his lunch and they introduced me to him and and he said oh no 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 he said there were actually radar records from that night but we don't have them and david said why don't you have them he says because they were requested and obtained by an outside agency now that's Mm. very yeah that's very reminiscent if we return again to Tim McMillan's article in The Popular Mechanics talking about how Gary Voorhees and many of those who were involved with the Nimitz incident, they said two people showed up and they you know, they took the radar data, right? Well, the same thing happened with the St. Clair County incident from back in 2000. Uh, somebody came and got that radar data from, the, from the, air, uh, the airport there. That's always intrigued me because it seems to suggest that there's an agency, maybe the U.S. Air Force, that definitely takes an interest in these. So if it were their own aircraft, why would the Air Force or some other agency be interested in studying radar data about these things? And that goes a long way with with everything we're saying about this. I mean, I mean, are they alien or are they not? I know I've said that probably three or four times in this half hour, Micah, but we really don't know. I mean, we want to to believe they are they are out there from somewhere, at least if you've seen them before, because it's not what our eyes are used to seeing. However, when you take, uh, you know, taking Michael Schratt's research with, where he always brings up Ben Rich, you know, saying that we've got the ability to get E.T. home again. I mean, yeah. it really makes you wonder. I mean, some of the craft that Michael has been able to uncover, whether it's secret space program or whether it's just black projects that by NASA or the CIA or whomever, I mean, we are dealing with technology that we could only dream of in a sci-fi cartoon magazine, something along those lines, and yet it's here and it's now. And it's it's hard to even think about the fact that, you know, some hidden base in Alaska or at some remote island like Diego Garcia, MH370. Anyways, uh-huh. <laughs> we, we, we don't know what is being hidden around the world because eventually these do have to land. Yeah, that's a good point. Eventually these do have to land. Or do they? You know, I mean, there was that other New York Times piece that came out a while back where they were discussing how – you know, these things, whatever they are, they seem to have a propulsion system or a fuel system that allows them to remain aloft far longer than our conventional aircraft. Now, again, you know, somebody I really respect, Tyler Rogaway over at the War Zone. I've uh, got a good friend named Brett Tingley who writes for the War Zone. And I've spoken to Tyler at length over the uh, uh, on the telephone about this. And he says, you know, in his opinion, these kinds of encounters that some of our Navy uh, fighter craft are describing of these beach ball sized things that they've nearly collided with and different things that, that are seen. He says he thinks that some of these technologies can be accounted for by uh, experimental or known technologies uh, that are being utilized and developed and utilized by the you know, U.S. Air Force, Navy, NSA, you know, et cetera, CIA. You know, again, it is most likely – that the majority of these things probably are of earthly origin, however strange and esoteric they may sound. But, you know, even Tyler and I talking, again, this was just a, a, a very casual phone conversation that he and I had kind of comparing notes. And trust me, I'm a lot like you. <laughs> Tim McMillan and I, we talk to everybody that we possibly can about this stuff. You know, if, you, if you're a journalist and you've written about this, we're going to reach out to them usually and, and compare notes, and they usually reach out to us, you know. So, I mean, <laughs> there's quite a, an interesting little web of, of researchers who are comparing notes about all of this, trying to get to the bottom of it, understand what exactly we may be dealing with, what the potentials are. 
But there was one of these oh crap moments that happened a while back. I know for Tim, uh, because when he was interviewing Nick Cook, you know, the author of the Hunt for Zero Point, when he was when he was interviewing him for the Popular Mechanics piece, um, Nick had kind of said to Tim, you know, it's like, look, man, when you spend several decades you know, looking for evidence of what kind of anti gravity technology we might have, and you don't find it. But then you are familiar enough with the UFO reports that seem to describe that kind of technology in the absence of any proof that it's ours. He says, you end up kind of having to go and, and look at it and say, okay, then then what else? What are we dealing with? What could these things be? You know, at the end of the day, rather than that driving home a conclusion – it causes me to step further away from any conclusions, and I think we have to, and in the true sense of skepticism, Dave, you know, in the true sense of, you know, going all the way back to the Purinists, uh, abstaining from making any conclusions because it was their philosophical belief that that no full knowledge could be obtained, and therefore they abstained from making any complete judgments. That might be a little extreme by today's standards, you know, and in keeping with the scientific method, you know, typically we make observations and observe patterns and things, and then based on hypotheses and tests, we try to establish conclusions based on repeatability of things that occur in scientific ex- experimentation. But I think that with the UFO phenomenon, there is enough about it that is anomalous, and yet there appears to be enough to suggest that there really is something and yet something that we know so little about that I have to step back and just abstain from making any final kind of judgments we really are not to that point yet there's too much about this that remains undetermined in my opinion aliens man it's the only way you can go when in (laughs) doubt aliens we got about a minute and 10 seconds before we got to go to break here on spaced out radio micah hanks is our guest tonight and we're having a blast here talking about it in your opinion as we go to break here in about a minute, what should people do if they actually see one of these? I mean, the realistic answer is take a photo or grab a video, but it never comes out properly. Should just people well, take it all in, document it? Yeah, that's a real good question. You know, I mean, I would say if it is a daytime incident and the object appears to be hovering, I would get as much video and footage as you can. But people have this tendency to want to hold the camera upright and zoom in on it and use that horrible digital zoom you know, what you want to try and do is get trees, buildings, mountains, get something else in the frame so that you have some sort of context so that you can relate the objects to another object, preferably a stationary one somewhere nearby. If it is a nighttime observation, the likelihood that unless it's really brightly lit, the likelihood that you're going to be able to film it at night with even a you know the best smartphone is, is very uh, unlikely. So I would say... Try to photograph it if you think you can, but don't live your life looking at that screen on your portable multifunction device. If you see a UFO and you have an opportunity to actually observe it, then observe it, look at it, and then write down as much as you can immediately afterward or record it, record yourself talking on your phone, do whatever, but try to document everything that you can and be a good observer. Note everything, the time, the distance, the orientation, the colors, everything that you can, because details are key. Two hours down, we got one hour to go on Spaced Out Radio. Micah Hanks continues with us right after the break on Spaced Out Radio. For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just 5 bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at 
purpleplates.com. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckrude, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. The SLR Vault is open for business, and do we have some cool swag for you to pick up? All you have to do is head over to our website and click on the SLR Vault. You have a variety of cool logos to choose from, and put them on anything you want. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, you name it, we can get it to you. So do your shopping by supporting the story you love. Get your Spaced Out Radio swag at the SOR Vault today. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio, or our website including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. Hey, space travelers, this is John Resig, founder of the Chide and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. Heading to Vancouver and looking for a night on the town? The Moose Vancouver is the bar that never stops rocking until 2 a.m. every night. The Moose has great food with everything on the menu from $6.95 to $8.95. Fantastic, vibrant staff and rock and roll that will bring you back to when the music was real, the hair was long, and the guitars were rocking. Get your party on at the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. At SpacedOutRadio.com, we have a little bit of everything for you to stay up late. So while you're there, check out our SOR Newswire, where our team brings you stories of the weird and strange to the WTF from around the globe. News on Bigfoot, UFOs, paranormal, Darwinian-type crime tales. It's the stories that the mainstream media usually won't touch. Well, we got them all on the SOR Newswire, only at SpacedOutRadio.com. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. A little bit of science, a little bit of skepticism. Add a dash of snark and you have the makings of Spaced Out Sundays with me, Everett Thiele. Together we will look into the reality of the paranormal with an open eye and rational thought. Oh, did I mention there'll be plenty of woo as well? Your time spent with Spaced Out Sundays will make the night even better. The chat rooms are open, 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, right here at spacedoutradio.com. 
Move over, brother, and let me own Saturday night. This is Rich Giordano, and I'm inviting you to tune on in to Spaced Out Saturday starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, 12 a.m. Eastern, where I'm going to bust open the lids on everything paranormal. Why? Because we want answers, and I'm the guy who's going to deliver those answers to you. Join the chat rooms, and we'll see you this Saturday. Just be there. No, really. A timepiece is a reflection of who you are. And what better way to show off the real you than with an Escape watch? Escape is a lifestyle brand accessorizing your days and nights. Choose to escape and create the life of discovery that you deserve. Dream. Play. Unite with your own personalized Escape watch. Head to escapewatches.com. There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. Every night on Space Out Radio, we have places for you to hang out. Hi, this is Carl. Join our SOR Space Travelers group on Facebook for live chat. On Twitter, using hashtag Space Out Radio, you can also join us in our Spreaker chat room. Check us out on Instagram at Dave Scott SOR. All of our archives are free on YouTube at Space Out Radio. By the way, I'll be watching you at your window until you do. Bye! you like to connect with us head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info now back to dave scott and sor welcome back to the third and final hour of spaced out radio tonight i am your host dave scott thank you so much for joining us want to give a shout out to everybody listening in on our digital affiliates kingdom of nye radio and revolution radio great to have you with us on our terrestrial side we're on in ridgecrest california KZFX 93.7 FM, KDNF AM 1560 in Dangerfield, Texas, KDUN AM 1030 in Reedsport, Oregon, WQEE 99.1 FM in Noonan, Georgia, and UPRN 107.7 FM in New Orleans. Don't forget, all of our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Snood. Snood is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot. Do a little shopping at the SOR vault, because you'd look good in our gear. we got some great books at We Read the Night, so check that out. Join the space travelers for 5 bucks a month, and Captain Shirk has you all up to date on the SOR Newswire. Talking with Micah Hanks tonight on Spaced Out Radio, great researcher, writer, got to get his books. You definitely got to get his books. His website, MicahHanks.com. We made an editorial decision tonight. We're having so much fun with Micah tonight. We're going to go to the distance with him. We're going to skip the news wire. Sorry, Captain Shirk. I know you're going to be offended by that. Don't hate me. Don't hate me. Rob Zombie still loves you. And, of course... The thought of the day, we'll do it all again tomorrow. I, I'm just having way too much fun with uh, Micah tonight. Micah, welcome back to the show. <laughs> well, I am honored to uh, help you oust your news hour and uh, go for one more, uh, I guess you'd call this in the parlance of uh, of those late night uh, beverage drinkers, one more for the road, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. You never, you never go wrong. What's another hour? What the hell? Yeah. Well, what, although, what, you know, what? again, I'm still on Lisbon time. Uh, you know, I spent uh, the last couple of weeks traveling in beautiful uh, Lisbon, Portugal, and also I was in the Azores. Um, Lisboa é muito fantástico. You know, I, I was I was able to pick up just enough Portuguese to get around, and of course to be able to order all the fantastic dishes, uh, sopa de peixe, you know, the fish soup, uh, mm-hmm. uh, porco de alentejano. Uh, I probably butchered that, but again, this is a very special dish that they serve over there, where it's diced pork with clams. All over it, and of course you can't go wrong with the bacalhau, right? The codfish. So anyway, yeah, I, I'm still on that Portuguese clock <laughs> right now. Nice, but, but I'm alive and I'm kicking, right? You know, hey, you know, nothing will keep me awake at night like talking about UFOs. So here we are. You know what? I do have to uh, give a couple of uh, do a little housekeeping here. Uh-huh. I go to my six year old's Christmas concert tonight. 
And you and I were talking before that, and I had to cut you off the phone because I was like, dude, I got to get in there. I got to go. go uh, and and I'm going to be honest with you. There's nothing more I can't stand <laughs> than, than Christmas concerts. I hated them when I was a kid, just was never a fan. You know, I go there, I support my child like any good parent does. And, you know, I tune out until my child is up. Then I tune in, you know, record it, give my little happy smile because, you know, I'm proud of my child and all that. But I hate oh, these yeah. things. You know, out of anything in the school curriculum that I would love to see eliminated, it's the Christmas concert. I, yeah. I really I, you know, just drives me nuts. But anyhow, the theme of the Christmas concert this year, uh -huh. Alien Invasion. <laughs> Uh, you can't make this stuff up, man. No. I, you if, if you go on my Instagram <laughs> account, Dave Scott, S-O-R, I put a picture up there. I'm like, can you believe this? Th this is real. And I'm like, this is so synchronistic with Micah coming on the show tonight, and I sent you a picture of it. We had a good laugh over that. The other thing I want to mention is we got a new space traveler, Aaron, on Twitter. Hey, Aaron, how you doing? He's asking what the password is for. Exactly. That's the only answer I could give. Oh. Exactly. What is the password for? Exactly. It's your job to figure it out. I've done the hard work right there. Yeah. Heavy lifting done. Exactly. Exactly. That's the only answer I can give. Hey, I want to ask you, Micah. Because you're a guy, you, you're mainly known for UFOs, but you also delve a little bit into the paranormal encrypted world as well. There's a lot of people out there. And, and once again, I know I've mentioned these two gentlemen a lot tonight, but John Tenney and David Weatherly, two of them, who believe there is this magical, maybe even cosmic thread that seems to intertwine itself and sow itself to the UFO community, to aliens, to Bigfoot, and the rest of the cryptid realm, to ghosts and the supernatural. And very few people are actually looking for that thread because it always seems that when one instance happens, the other one isn't too far behind. Have you ever thought about what that thread is? Have you ever even looked into it? Yes, I have. Yes, I do. Although I try not to entertain that approach very often. And I'll tell you why. You know, I, a few years ago, I got to a point, I guess, where I was, I was fairly bored with a nuts and bolts interpretation of UFOs or whatever else. And I started trying to challenge myself to think outside the box. But the problem with that is that, you know, when you put a bunch of imagination behind trying to solve unexplained quantities, <laughs> what you end up with is a very, you know, imaginative interpretation of it, which is often essentially imaginary. And again, it's not to say that we shouldn't, you know, think outside the box and, and you know, give ourselves uh, to spending time with, you know, trying to, to think differently about the phenomenon. You know, with UFOs, for example, you know, I'll try and I'm going to tie this in with cryptids in a, in a very interesting way, I think, uh, because, again, my goal tonight is to try and to discuss the history of UFO research. And I think that there's a good way that we can marry all this together with a, a quick history lesson in relation to UFOs. But again, I think that you have to think outside the box. And I often do that with UFOs. I'll, I'll say, what if it's this? What if it's that? What if it's this? You know, what if? The extraterrestrial hypothesis ultimately is the best answer, but we aren't dealing with EBEs, extraterrestrial biological entities. What if these are some kind of, you know, intelligent machine or, you know, artificially intelligent kind of manifestation of intelligence rather than being physical flesh and blood extraterrestrials? You know, I've looked at everything from the idea of time travelers, which, you know, that's not really a hypothesis I endorse, although it was a concept that uh, was featured pretty extensively in a book I wrote a few years ago called The UFO Singularity. The goal of that book was to look at the artificial intelligence component in relation to UFOs. Unfortunately, what I've seen over this, you know, the years ensuing since uh, that book was written is that most people who read it, their big takeaway is Micah Hanks thinks alien 
you know, for UFO craft are time travelers from the future. And he's wrong, you know. Again, uh, in the spirit of many researchers who have come before me who have proposed theories but who didn't marry themselves to them, uh, you know, my my general takeaway from studying UFOs is not that they're most likely to be time travelers from the future. In fact, I would rank that among uh, one of the less likely, <laughs> you know, possibilities, but it is a possibility nonetheless, however unlikely it is. Uh, so, you know, in trying to frame how artificial intelligence might play into the UFO phenomenon, you know, I definitely touched on time travel, but I'm, I think that a lot of people miss the AI part and just kind of gravitated toward the whole time travel thing. That idea, by the way, actually was recently also um, posited by uh, Dr. Michael P. Masters, an anthropologist who has written a very interesting book called uh, identified flying objects, and his contention is that he also thinks these things are likely to be time travelers. A lot of people like that theory, and again, having written about it, at least touched on it in the, in, in the book myself, you know, I, I don't think it's necessarily the most likely interpretation of this phenomenon. So let me just be clear, because I still get emails these days from people saying, you know, I don't think you're right, Micah, that these things are all time travelers. Well, that wasn't really the broader point I was trying to make with that book in the first place, and I certainly don't marry myself to that idea. But I think it's important, coming full circle here, to look at all the different possibilities, and then after weighing the different alternatives, look at what is most likely. And what is both unsatisfying and troubling to me at times is that, you know, after we look at all these possibilities, the UFO phenomenon generally keeps coming back around to the idea of extraterrestrials, being one of the most likely contenders if it is not some technology from right here on Earth, i.e. our own technology. But again, I think that that is an unsatisfactory interpretation, too. I don't think, in other words, that innovations that are occurring in the black project world, secretly behind the scenes, subcontracted by you know deep state government groups and the like, I don't think that that is a, a very complete um, explanation for the broader UFO phenomenon. Now, I'll say this, coming back to the idea of could some of these different kinds of paranormal phenomena be married together or related to one another, like you were asking, if we look at the history of UFOs, you know, starting in 1947, Kenneth Arnold says he sees mystery planes of some kind. He described them initially as planes, and they were reported as such in the popular press at the time. However, it was the, the behavior of those aircraft, the way that they moved, he said almost like a saucer skipping across the water, that gave rise to that popular uh, phrase, which the phraseology actually was introduced by the media itself, not Kenneth Arnold, flying saucers. That, that again, kind of it, it went viral, I guess, in the pre-internet era <laughs> that that occurred. Nonetheless, that idea really kind of went viral. It was big news. The Air Force gets involved. They're trying to assess whether this is a national security threat. And we have, you know, the stories, of course, of that famous, uh, I think it was during the Project Sign iteration of the U.S. Air Force uh, studies of this phenomenon. But again, there were many of them, Project Sign, Project Grudge. Uh, of course, Project Blue Book was uh, the most extensive and the most famous of all those. But there was this estimate of the situation that occurred where, one interpretation proposed by those with the U.S. Air Force who were analyzing the UFO, the good UFO reports, was that this might be extraterrestrial in origin. And the story goes that top brass didn't like that determination, and they ordered all copies of that estimate of the, of the situation to be destroyed. They didn't want that getting out, but of course it did. Uh, in large part thanks to uh, Donald Kehoe, who had been a former uh, officer himself, but uh, a writer, a journalist who had written an article in 19, actually I think it was written in 49, published in December of 1949, but it was the January 1950 edition of True Magazine, where he wrote a very lengthy article driving home the point that he thought these UFOs, these flying saucers, they weren't actually called UFOs at that time, that term hadn't been introduced yet by Edward Ruppelt, uh, but these flying saucers he believed were of extraterrestrial origin. Okay, Fast forward a couple of decades. After, after a couple of decades of both civilian research groups like uh, APRO, the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, headed by Jim and Coral Lorenzen, uh, the aforementioned Major uh, Donald Kehoe, uh, we had the Project Blue Book, 
uh, overseen by the uh, U.S. Air Force. Uh, its rise and its ultimate conclusion around 1968, 1969 with the University of Colorado UFO Project, overseen by Edward U. Condon, um, and hence why it's called the Condon Committee. Uh, we, we see all of this time over that two-decade period or so where people are attempting to understand what UFOs are, and the general popular interpretation is that these are extraterrestrial. By the late 1960s and early 1970s, some researchers were beginning to see that as being an untenable explanation. And the real point break in this narrative, I think, was probably the publication of a book by Jacques Vallée called Passport to Magonia. In that book, he begins to look at UFOs and he says, look, we cannot deny that there are aspects of the UFO experience that are mirrored in the folk tales, the fairy folklore of the British Isles and things like this. And so he introduces this idea. Of course, around the same time, we had books being published by authors like John Keel, uh, Operation Trojan Horse, where uh, this idea of an ultra-terrestrial rather than extraterrestrial hypothesis is introduced, that this is something much more esoteric and complex and may be even beyond the scope of physical flesh and blood extraterrestrials, for all we know. Mm-hmm. And then there's, an, there's another book, though, that was – it's it's far less often mentioned, but it's very important to mention in this context. It was a book that was written by Jerome Clark. Of course, he's a famous Fortean chronicler. And the co-author on that book was Lauren Coleman, who is best known as a cryptozoologist in Fortean who has written extensively about – subjects like Sasquatch and Mothman and the like, Coleman and Clark write a book called The Unidentified. And in this book, they present the a, a very similar idea to that, that that Jacques Vallée presents in Passport to Magonia, but their whole contention is maybe there is more continuity between not only UFOs and fairy folklore and things, but also reports of sightings of cryptids and things like Sasquatch and the like. So, you know, again, when you ask... <laughs> Do I ever entertain the idea that there might be more continuity between these things? I don't generally myself operate in that paradigm, but historically speaking, I think we can kind of look at that 1970s period where authors start branching out and saying, what if there's something else going on here completely? That's, I think, the genesis of that idea. Clark and Coleman later refuted that and said, we no longer think that. That was an idea we entertained at that time, kind of like I did with UFO Singularity. Many authors actually still hold on to that possibility. They say, what if all this stuff is far weirder than any of us really think? What if the UFOs, Sasquatch, whatever else, what if it's all part of one grand unified theory of the paranormal that we haven't explained yet? Some researchers are more comfortable with that than looking at these things separately. But again, I think more importantly, we we should understand where those ideas come from and what gave rise to those theories. It really was essentially the dissatisfaction that many UFO researchers had with seeing the extraterrestrial hypothesis as being a viable explanation for UFO sightings. That's quite a history lesson right there. Quite a history (laughs) lesson. You know, and, you know, I I had about three or four questions going on while in my head while they asked me, damned if I can think of any of those right now in regards to it. But, you know, you mentioned Lauren Coleman, who is very well respected in this entire field. And with that thread, with that thread that we are trying to connect, do you think, and maybe I'm going off on a weird tangent here. But do you think when 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 people started like John Keel started to break things down to a, a a level of ultra terrestrials, do you think we as human beings have complicated this UFO cryptid paranormal type issue a hell of a lot more than what it actually needs to be? Yeah, I do think we have. But again, I would say that I think it's important to at least engage in the intellectual exercise. You know, like Dave, we, we've we got to sit down sometimes with a piece of paper, you know, and start drawing, you know, circles. OK, here's UFOs. We, we And then we start drawing lines off and here's a bubble and here's a bubble, you know, and create these, <laughs> you know, these these flow charts or whatever and everything. Um, brainstorm. What else could this be? If you don't apply creativity You know, there's always the possibility that you miss something along the way. The problem is there are a lot of researchers that I think they 
they come up with a with an alternative and then they write a book about it or something and then they feel married to that idea. And when a researcher feels married to an idea and they start doubling down and acting like, well, now that I've written about this, now that I've proposed this, even if someone argues and makes a good argument to the contrary, I've got to defend my position. And then you get dogmatic. You know, this is where dogmatism enters the argument. And so you see a lot of good researchers, I think, stray when they propose a theory and then they do marry themselves to it. Again, something I always loved about uh, Coleman and Clark with that book that they wrote, The Unidentified, you know, they, they'll tell you today that we no longer endorse the views that we espoused in that book. But that book is very important in the broader context and in the historical narrative because it defines a moment in history where that way of thinking about these phenomena was more well accepted, you know. Um, again, Lauren Coleman is one of the best researchers, in my opinion, that that is you know alive today. Not just in relation to Sasquatch, although that's what he's best known for. Uh, you know, Lauren is uh, just you know he's 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 good in so many ways, and you know being able to go back and look at early writings like that of his uh, caused me to you know that that's that's where a lot of my respect for him is rooted. He was one of these people who co-authored a book with Jerome Clark, another fantastic researcher who I have tremendous respect for. Um, both of them, I think, have gone in very different directions from what they proposed in that book, especially in Jerome Clark's case. He's become a lot more um, skeptical, and although he is still an advocate for a reality behind UFOs, he's very skeptical, and he is um, much more of a of a nuts and bolts kind of approach these days. But see, they proposed an idea and they didn't become married to it. And, you know, I think that that's a necessary part of the exploration process, you know, the process of assessing the phenomenon. You know, scientists do this kind of thing, too. Um, I was talking with Chris Cogswell and he was discussing metamaterials, you know, and nanotechnology for me. And he said that part of what's fascinating about these technologies and these materials is we produce these in the lab, but we don't really know how they work. And I said, hold on now. What do you mean we produce them in the lab, but we don't know how they work? And he says, well, see, a lot of these syntheses that lead to the creation of these sorts of materials, they occur at random, right? Because we're just testing different syntheses in the lab and everything. And when we get one that works, we may not understand all of its physical, you know, material capacities, you know, all the all the elements that cause it to behave a certain way. And so he says, this is a fascinating thing about this aspect of these of these uh, material sciences is that, you know, we sometimes create things in laboratories that we don't fully understand ourselves, but we create them and we can observe them. And I said, now that's interesting, right? That we create things that we don't even fully understand. In other words, the scientific process at times involves a certain degree of guesswork, a certain degree of let's fling it against the wall and see what sticks. And so when it comes to assessing the unexplained, I do think that there is a useful element When we see authors, writers, researchers, if they engage in responsible speculation and present a well-thought-out argument that later, a couple of years later, is refuted, and the refutation may actually occur by those authors themselves, we proposed the idea because we felt like those points needed to be made. But on further reflection, yeah, but but on further reflection, we don't think it's the best explanation. There you go. Mike, I'm going to get you to hang on right there. Mike is going the distance tonight on Space Out Radio with us. Stay tuned. More Micah Hanks right after this on the Mighty SOR. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. 
Every night on Spaced Out Radio, we have places for you to hang out. Hi, this is Carl. Join our SOR Space Travelers group on Facebook for live chat. On Twitter, using hashtag Spaced Out Radio, you can also join us in our Spreaker chat room. Check us out on Instagram at Dave Scott SOR. All of our archives are free on YouTube at Spaced Out Radio. By the way, I'll be watching you at your window until you do. Bye! At SpacedOutRadio.com, we have a little bit of everything for you to stay up late. So while you're there, check out our SOR Newswire, where our team brings you stories of the weird and strange to the WTF from around the globe. News on Bigfoot, UFOs, paranormal, Darwinian-type crime tales. It's the stories that the mainstream media usually won't touch. Well, we got them all on the SOR Newswire, only at SpacedOutRadio.com. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Hey, Spaced Out Radio fans, it's John Rezik, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. Our goal is to make the life of veterans, first responders, and those with rare medical conditions 10% happier. We do this by donating one grant item, ranging from dance to therapy programs to prosthetic limbs, to those who need it most. To contribute to Spaced Out Radio's official charity, head over to chivecharities.org and become a donor today. A little bit of science, a little bit of skepticism. Add a dash of snark and you have the makings of Spaced Out Sundays with me, Everett Thiemann. Together we will look into the reality of the paranormal with an open eye and rational thought. Oh, did I mention there'll be plenty of woo as well? Your time spent with Spaced Out Sundays will make the night even better. The chat rooms are open, 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, right here at spacedoutradio.com. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckrude, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. Heading to Vancouver and looking for a night on the town? The Moose Vancouver is the bar that never stops rocking until 2 a.m. every night. The Moose has great food with everything on the menu from $6.95 to $8.95. Fantastic, vibrant staff and rock and roll that will bring you back to when the music was real, the hair was long, and the guitars were rocking. Get your party on at the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Hey everybody, the SOR Space Travelers is open. For just five bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members-only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great forum for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. You wanted new SOR gear, and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable, and you can look good representing your favorite show. So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today.
Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. Move over, brother, and let me own Saturday night. This is Rich Giordano, and I'm inviting you to tune on in to Spaced Out Saturday starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, 12 a.m. Eastern, where I'm going to bust open the lids on everything paranormal. Why? Because we want answers, and I'm the guy who's going to deliver those answers to you. Join the chat rooms, and we'll see you this Saturday. Just be there. No, really. third we're heading for home tonight on spaced out radio i'm your host dave scott sitting in the captain's chair of sor headquarters what a pleasure to have each and every one of you with us we're going the distance tonight with micah hanks so i just want to remind you that if you've missed portions of this show or others you can always check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio do me the favor hit that subscribe button our website is spaced out radio.com where we have a plethora of features for you rock out to bumblefoot do a little shopping at the sor vault great authors great books that we read the night our space travelers club is five bucks a month and captain shirk has you always up to date on the sor newswire once again we're continuing our talk with micah hanks tonight on everything ufos history cryptids ghosts you name it we're talking about it tonight micah's website is micahhanks.com micah before we get into anything too heavy in this final 30 minutes with you we gotta know Our audience needs to know, when it comes to Devil's Tower, are you Team Stump or are you Team Rock? I am Team Rock. Yeah. Yeah, again, that is, uh, you can see, in fact, I've been to Devil's Tower. Uh, You know, I went there with uh, Alejandro Rojas and David Marler and, uh, you know, a number of other fantastic guys. Mark D'Antonio, my favorite astronomer and also a, uh, a uh, imaging expert who consults MUFON. But again, the uh, the hexagonal basaltic stone formations that are fallen off the sides of that. Again, what, what we're looking at there is a volcanic intrusion, okay? Imagine in the ancient past there was a volcanic shoot, a volcano essentially, and the magma within that volcano hardens and the the soil on the exterior that formed the volcano erodes away over time and it reveals the solidified well this is one theory geologically speaking one theory about the formation of devil's tower the uh erosion pulls away the exterior and all that is left is that solidified magma shoot and What's peculiar is, again, this this volcanic stone, this basalt, okay, the basalt forms in these peculiar-looking hexagonal strips that over time have, some of them, broken away and fallen down at the base of Devil's Tower. So when you go to the base of Devil's Tower, there's Alejandro and David and, and uh, er, um, Lee Spiegel, you know, former writer for the Huffington Post, and, and uh, Mark D'Antonio and I, and... And we're all standing down there at the base, and we're seeing those huge hexagonal-shaped basaltic columns broken all over the ground and everything. And it's it's quite enigmatic. And when you see those, the first thing that you say is, well, nothing in nature forms like that. But in fact, geologists know otherwise, and that is indeed the case. So my guess would be that although it does indeed resemble a large tree stump, what we're seeing is the remnant of an ancient volcanic intrusion uh, and, in fact, the Devil's Tower Curious though it is in appearance, is indeed purely geological in origin and easily explained at that. <laughs> That's, uh, well, but, but, we're we're, we're going to agree to disagree with you on that one because <laughs> you know you know we don't sell Team Stump T-shirts 
on our website for just nothing, you know. You know, there's <laughs> there's something to that. Yeah. And you know, I, I you know, and I'm I'm just going to read some some uh uh questions or some comments here. Well, PBR says it's a volcano. No, it's not. It's a tree stump. Ron says it's a tree stump. Joe says it's a tree stump. Oh, you're you see, you're you're losing ground here. You had the audience, my friend. You had the audience, and then, <laughs> and then you I had just to start lost talking. Them. I had to start talking the, geology. <laughs> yeah, you son of a gun. You son of a gun. You know, honestly, I don't know why, but uh, now, no, it's it's one of the running jokes that we have around here. We got a lot. We got a lot of them. We we do have a lot of them, and. Um, Captain Shirk's uh, pointing her finger at me on my on my uh, Facebook Messenger here because I'm skipping the news tonight for you. I'll have to take the beating tomorrow. I'll take the beating tomorrow. But Uh-oh. no, we, we we like to have a little bit of fun around here. It's the same thing with with uh, the password. You know, we like to have a little fun around here because you got to have those inside jokes. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, you gotta have those in, inside jokes, and Team Stump is definitely one of them, and we absolutely love it. We do, Micah. While we have you here, and uh, and what a great show this has been tonight. At least you know for me, and and getting to know you a little bit better, which is something that I've wanted to do for a long time. What are we missing, in your opinion? when it comes to UFOs or comes to this phenomenon. And I'm not saying the research aspect. I'm saying the average everyday person who, in layman's terms, may have a, a keen interest in this subject, doesn't know where to look, or maybe is doing their own uh, amateur sleuthing around regarding these subjects. What are we missing? What should we be looking for moving forward or even as of now? Well, that's a tall order. Um, you know, I would say, let, let me begin for the um, for the interested um, UFO, the, 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 you know, not even the budding researcher, but just the interested uh, party who would want to read more about this subject. I think a good place to begin is Edward Ruppelt's book, The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects. Edward Ruppelt, for those who don't know, was the first head of the U.S. Air Force's Project Blue Book, not their first UFO study, but certainly their lengthiest and most significant. Now, the problem with that book is that there were two versions. Uh, The second edition, the later edition that came out right around the time that Ruppelt died, and he was only in his late 30s when he died, that second edition departed from the tone of the first one. The first one, he left it very open-ended. He reported on the flying saucer story up to that point, which, again, he was working between the years of around 1947 and 1952, so he only had a couple of years, well, not a couple, a few years to work in there. The the next edition of the book added some additional commentary, a couple of you know unique chapters at the end, and Ruppelt really played down the phenomenon. Uh, by that time, he was saying he was almost certain there was no real UFO phenomenon at all. So there's a real shift in his tone. Most uh, publishing houses that have reprinted that book or websites that feature it, because I believe it's in the public domain now, they almost all feature that first edition of the book. And, you know, I don't think that's really fair. I think that although people tend to want to feature the version of the book that conforms to the opinion about UFOs that they have, you know, the final version of the book that Ruppelt put out was very different. He was much more skeptical. This is a trend you see among a lot of UFO researchers that over time they become more skeptical of the phenomenon. Um, Or at very least, even if they are advocates of the existence of a phenomenon, they become more skeptical of their interpretation of it. I'm the same way. You know, when I was a kid, I would have just taken for granted that ET equals, you know, UFO and UFO equals ET. By being more open-minded toward other possibilities, but confirming or committing to none and always trying first to explain UFOs as IFOs, i.e. the misidentification of prosaic sources like aircraft, natural phenomena, you know, lightning, ball lightning, things along these lines, whatever. You know, it's not to try and say, I don't think that there's a possibility that there are UFOs. It is to try and be responsible as a researcher of UFOs. I think Ruppelt was trying to do the same thing and his 
general conclusion was, you know, I think there's less to this than I thought there was a couple of years ago when I published this book. So the second edition of the book with the skeptical conclusion is available courtesy of the Anomaly Archives, which is a website. If you go online, you can just search for the Anomaly Archives. It's a website, I believe, that is uh, – there's an actual archive in – I think it's in Sweden – is where they're based, but they have a website and they have a lot of books you can download. And they've got that second edition of Reppelt's book, which is harder to find. I recommend that you read that, especially since it's freely available online if you know where to look. Um, there's also a book that was written by Alan Hendry, I believe in 1976, called The UFO Handbook. For serious UFO researchers or aspiring researchers, that book is a must. And yet, again, most researchers these days probably don't even know about the existence of that book. I don't think it was ever reprinted. You can still buy used copies online. Um, Alan Henry was a commercial artist. Uh, I think he had a bachelor's degree in um, astronomy, and he worked for a couple of years as a full-time UFO investigator uh, for the Center for UFO Studies headed by J. Allen Hynek in Chicago. And so uh, Henry, based on his couple of years as a professional UFO researcher, he wrote this book, The UFO Handbook, which is truly a indispensable book for anyone who really wants to understand UFOs and how to identify prosaic things that are often misidentified as those. But as far as things that I think were missing in the UFO narrative, again, uh, it comes back to something that I, I stumbled over earlier in, in trying to say, and I think it might have been Keel who had said it, uh, you know, to hell with the answer, what was the question? I'm sure many people have said that. I Again, I'm, I'm spitballing and I haven't got Google in front of me, so <laughs> somebody traced the origins of that quote for me. But, you know, with UFOs, we're so hell-bent on trying to figure out what they are. Maybe the conclusion isn't as important as the question. You know, Jacques Vallée and a lot of people over the years have, have asked the question, what, rather than understanding UFOs, what is the significance of the human relationship to them? Right? Are they? A, what? 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 What do they represent to us? How does? Again, I've often asked the question: If UFOs were were proven at some point not to exist at all, and it was purely a fabrication or an imaginary, imaginary, you know, faculty of the human consciousness, you know. Our perception of what we believe to be as a physical, tangible phenomenon alone, you know, that has had a profound effect on human society and civilization. You know, there are rocket scientists and, you know, there are, um, you know, aviation uh, experimentalists and, and things who have been inspired by UFO reports. You know, pilots like Dave Fravor who see these things and say, I want to fly that pretty hard to say if they've seen something like that and said they wanted to fly it that they didn't see anything at all but again my argument the philosophical um you know the the thought experiment i'm presenting is ufos don't have to exist for our interest in the idea of aircraft anomalous aircraft extraterrestrial visitation etc that has a profound enough influence on our culture that the idea alone has you know it's it's spurred innovation and it has driven our own technological exploits. And our reaching for the stars, we could say, could be influenced by an idea alone. In that regard, saucers, flying saucers, you know, don't even have to exist for them to have a significant impact on our culture, our society, our civilization, you know. So that's interesting. I happen to think, however, that there is more than just an idea behind them. I do think that there's a physical, tangible uh, you know, phenomena. I don't know what that is. Um, I have some ideas, but it is a significant enough phenomenon that I don't think it has to exist for it to have an impact on the progression of human technological growth, which is pretty damned incredible if you think about it. What about just wanting the experience? I mean, I, I mean that sounds so easy to say. I mean, we have a lot of listeners out there who aren't researchers, but these types of shows intrigue them. And they want that experience so bad, and it never happens. Yet you get some people out there, Micah, where they're getting, you know, something anomalous happening every second day of their life for the last 25 years. And there's a lot of people out there that seem a little ripped off by that. 
<laughs> or feel that way. You know, including a lot of researchers. I'm sure you would love to have your own unexplained experience that you just think, you know, wow, what is this big-headed gray dude with big black eyes standing in front of me? You know, Stan, is that you? Are you Carl's brother? Stan? I don't know. I think that's a good name, though. Yeah, if Carl's brother solid, ever shows up. We, solid name. We should call him Stan. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, that's paying tribute to the late, great Stanton Friedman, a guy I was very fond of and, uh, you know, uh, somebody who I think uh, in in years to come, his res- his research, you know, may even prove to be more uh, impactful than it was even during his own lifetime. But, um, yeah, I am one of those people who would love to have that experience, you know, as a person who I I know a lot of people who are skeptics by the modern definition of skepticism, having earlier in the program differentiated that from, for instance, the Marcelo Truzies and the, you know, some of the more open-minded skeptics who were co-founders of PSYCOP, which later became CSI, the Committee for, well, I guess it's just the Committee for Scientific Investigation, CSI. It's not. It's no longer PSYCOP is the point. But again, if you look at the progression of skepticism over time from the Pyrrhonists of ancient Greece to the modern skeptic that says there's no room for such outlandish ideas as flying saucers, you know, I differ with that kind of skepticism in the sense that, to me, a true skeptic does not marry themselves to any conclusions where, again, fundamentally belief is involved. If you believe that 100% of the time you can explain all unexplained phenomenon, then I, my friend, am skeptical of your skepticism. But skepticism has to be maintained nonetheless. And so as a person who, and and that in the spirit of true scientific inquiry, which I make no claim whatsoever to being a scientist, but I think I am a amateur historical researcher who tries to be scientifically minded as much as I can. I think that in that regard, fundamentally as a skeptic, I want to have that experience. I haven't had it, but I want to have that experience. I mean, I would, I I would volunteer to be an abductee, you know, (laughs) Let me be first in line. You know, I want to have that experience if that would, you know, take me to that next level and reshape my thinking, my orientation with all this, you know. So, yeah, I guess I am one of those people who feels, yeah, come on, why not me? You know, that would answer an awful lot of questions, or at very least it would <laughs> it would give rise to a few new ones. Well, you know, that experience, though, it's profound. It's life-changing. It's something that... Once you have that, and I wish, you know, a lot of researchers such as yourself could have that experience. I really, really do, because all of a sudden, I don't even know how to explain it, and I'm not going to explain it well, Micah, and to our audience, and I apologize for that, but you just don't care anymore because you know what you saw. And that is probably one of the most frustrating yet profound statements an experiencer can say is, I know what I saw. And you can't change my mind about that. I mean, I have I have debated a good friend of this show and yours as well, uh, Mark D'Antonio, mm-hmm. about this. I Over a ghost photo that was taken at our local museum, I have debated Uh, UFO uh, skeptics, scientists, people have uh, heard me go after, you know, Chris Cogswell on on a couple of occasions about it. And I and I believe that we have to be able to do that because I don't understand what you're looking for. And people who have experienced things have troubles understanding what people like you are looking for as well. And I guess as a researcher, when you get somebody yelling in your face or emailing you very harshly or tersely and saying, you don't know what the hell you're talking about, you know, my experience is this, my experience is that, you have to remain skeptical. But how do you deal with that? Yeah. I mean, fundamentally, it seems to suggest that the phenomenon that is so intriguing to all of us is really almost secondary to our attempts to understand ourselves. And that may sound like it's, you know, philosophical mumbo jumbo psycho babble, but no, I mean I'm I'm serious. The most important thing here is to understand the way that the mind works, the you know, human perception, 
uh, the differences between one person's perception to another person's, you know, the differences between people who have had experiences that seem to fall outside of the normal realm or spectrum of, of you know, everyday experiences versus, you know, those who interpret things in very cold, hard, logical, you know, reality is exactly what it appears to be on the daily, everyday, you know, level. All these different possibilities in relation to the human experience that seems to be the big question and in that context i think that we could probably make a safe argument that you know those researchers who say that there's an element of and this could be a whole other conversation so i guess we drop an easter egg here uh those researchers who would argue that to understand the ufo phenomenon requires a deeper understanding of human consciousness are probably correct we may differ on what that means, but fundamentally, nonetheless, I think it remains that there is an aspect of ourselves that we have yet to unlock, but doing so may help deepen our knowledge of the phenomenon that we seek. And you end on a very, very profound note, my friend. As we got about one minute here, or 30 seconds here. I want to say thank you, Micah, for coming on Spaced Out Radio tonight. What a pleasure to have you go the full distance on your first uh, uh, interview with us. And I can honestly say I hope this definitely won't be your last. Oh, I'd love to come back anytime, man. My pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. I'm going to get you to hold on because i got to kind of wrap this thing up here. Sure. I want to say a big thank you to Micah Hanks for coming on Spaced Out Radio tonight. His website, MicahHanks.com. We're going to do the Thought of the Dave tomorrow, as well as Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Sorry about tonight, Captain. I was just having way too much fun. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, in your cars, at work, in our chat rooms on Revolution Radio, Spreaker, LGAB, Facebook, the SOR Space Travelers Club on our website, and, of course, Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. You are all amazing tonight. Thank you so much. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for sharing your evening with us. Because together, my friends, we own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Have a great night, everybody. We end the week with Carrie Ann Sanders. So we prepare for the new year spiritually. She's beautiful and a lot of fun. We'll tune in and head into the weekend on that route. Have a good night. Bye-bye.